This is Jocko Podcast number 195 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. How much, how much is enough? I mean, how much does a person have to give before they can say that they've given enough? I think that answer is different for different people. There are some people that don't give very much at all. Maybe they give just enough to be called a participant at best. And some people don't even get there. They aren't even in the game. But then if you go to the other end of the spectrum, there are other people who give and give and give and make sacrifice after sacrifice, and that still isn't enough. They remain ready and willing to give even more, to make more sacrifices, sacrifices that many of us can't even comprehend. And then they look up and say, what else can I do? These are rare people. And it's an honor to have one of those people here with us tonight, one of those people who has served with honor, deployed repeatedly to war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan, a man who suffered devastating wounds, lost both of his legs, but that didn't stop him. He never felt sorry for himself. Instead, he used the pain to make himself stronger and tougher and better. And he represented America in the Paralympic Games, bringing home the bronze medal for rowing. He rode a bike across America from Maine to California to raise money for veteran causes, but that still wasn't enough. So to raise even more money and raise more awareness for veterans charities, he ran 31 marathons in 31 days. And yes, you heard that correctly, 31 marathons in 31 days. But he decided that he still hadn't given enough. And after his, all this, all these accomplishments, his service in the Marine Corps, he still wants to serve. So now he's taking on another challenge. He is running for the 10th congressional seat in his home state of Virginia, which it might not be the toughest battle that he's ever fought, but it will certainly or almost certainly could be the nastiest. But you know what? He is game, of course. His name is Rob Jones. He's a Marine. He's a wounded warrior. He's an Olympian. He's an inspiration to everyone that's ever met him. He's been on this podcast twice before, number 92 and number 116. So if you haven't listened to those, go back and do so. But if you have, well, here he is. Once again, my brother, Rob Jones. Rob, welcome back, man. Uh, you know, I would say that I've been asked that several times, haven't you given enough? And I always say uh, it has. it's not going to be enough until six Marines carry me in a coffin, put me in the ground in Arlington. <laughs> so I'm going to keep doing it. So what led you to make this decision to make this political run? I mean, what, what, what the hell happened? Because let's face it. Signing up for politics, that that is like signing up for just extreme punishment, <laughs> extreme <laughs> mental punishment of people coming after you all the time. People don't care about your, you know, the way it affects you, the way it affects your family. I mean, it gets crazy in politics. So, what was it that made you say to yourself? okay, you know what, it's time for me to do this. 
Yeah, you know, I've just noticed over the last few years the uh, deteriorating environment in uh, in Congress and the federal government, and I just saw that we need leaders there. And the only way we're going to get leaders there is if leaders step up and they put themselves into that arena, take the risk uh, of, you know, being under fire from these people. You know, <clears throat> kind of harkens back to, I think I talked about this last time when I talked, I talked about proof the lane, kind of mm-hmm. how I was, uh, you know, when you when you searching for IEDs, uh, you have to go out there and you have to step on the ground and make sure that there's not an IED there. So you just kind of step on it. And if it blows up, well, guess what? There's an IED there. If it doesn't, you get to take another step. And what I learned from that is that uh, in Afghanistan, there's every every single day in Iraq too, every single day, there are times, countless times, where somebody has to step forward and do the dangerous thing, do the difficult thing for the good of everybody else. And life is no different. And, you know, politics is no different. Somebody has to step forward and take that risk, enter into the arena if we want to see meaningful change. So, you know, in uh, with respect to what you said, I'm just trying to continue my service in that way and have the best impact I can. Yeah, well, that's definitely a, a different kind of minefield, but it's a yeah. minefield indeed <laughs> that you're stepping into. And I think one of the things, and you and I were talking about this earlier, when I talk to people and I talk to, I, I do pretty good in talking to people from all different kind of political viewpoints. Mm. But one thing that I, I've seen and I think this has a lot to do with kind of where we've gotten to this completely divisive culture in politics is that people lack humility. Like the normal person that years ago would have said, oh, well, you know, let me hear you out. Mm-hmm. Now that person, a normal person, you can talk to them and they they're, they lack humility to say, you know what, maybe this person has a, viewpoint that makes some kind of sense. Maybe there's some portion, instead of thinking, you know what, I am 100% right. Mm-hmm. My my political viewpoint is 100% right, which means that your political viewpoint is 100%, 100% wrong. There's no value in anything that you're gonna say. You're 100% wrong mm-hmm. and I'm 100% right. And that's, the the line is drawn. It's, it's not even like, you, oh, the line gets drawn. The line is drawn. That and it starts with, hey, I'm 19 years old, or 26 years old, or 38 years old, and I, everything that I believe is 100% right, and that means everyone else is 100% wrong, unless you agree with me. If you agree with me 100%, you're okay. By the way, you've seen it on both sides. Somebody, if somebody makes a step outside of the traditional views of the left or the traditional views of the right. These are people that are on the left or are on the right. They get shredded by their own side Mm -hmm. because everyone's attitude is, I am 100% right, you don't know anything. Yeah, I mean, and what we have to remember, what we have to be aware of with the humility piece is that nobody actually knows (laughs) for sure. Nobody does. Yeah. We have evidence, we have theories, but we don't know what's gonna happen when we pass you know, some legislation that and you can see in that over the course of the entirety of our country's history, we pass a little like, oh, this is this is what it's going to do. It's going to do this, this and this pass the bill. And then that, that and that happens. You're like, oh, unintended consequences. There's no way to predict it. So we have to go in there with the best knowledge that we can and all the preparation that we can. But, you know, keep in mind that we don't actually know everything. And we also have to remember that that person that disagrees with you. Uh, they just they're just coming from a different perspective from you. You know, they you have to what it really boils down to is you both want the same thing, I think, usually, if you disagree with somebody, you both want, you know, the American people to have the best lives they can and have the most meaningful lives they can. Uh, you just want to go about it in, in a different way. And so as long as you can maintain that attitude, like this person really, they want the best for these people. Um, and then you, that's how you can kind of just disagree with them in a civil manner. Mm -hmm. What was the, who put the idea in your head? How did that, that, 
how, who, did someone plant the seed? Did you sit in there watching TV or watching a, somebody speak and you were like, no, I got to get in this game? Yeah, you know, it was just, uh, yeah, it popped into my head like a lot of these other crazy ideas that I have, you know. <laughs> You're just out one time. And, and, you know, a lot of it has to do with I thought of the idea initially uh, when I was training for the month of marathons. So, you know, kind of always trying to think ahead of, you know, what's the next thing going to be? What's the next thing going to be? And I didn't do the month of marathons to prepare me for, for this. It was just kind of an idea that I had, like maybe after the month of marathons is done, maybe I'll, you know, take the next step and try and do a little bit more and I'll try and run for Congress. And so, you know, I thought of the, the idea then, and then it kind of, you know, I, I was doing other things. I ran the month of marathons, came back, still didn't really know what to do or whether or not it was possible. And then uh, after the 2018 election, I texted a buddy that I had from uh, from the hospital named Brian Mast, who's a double above knee amputee, and I just he he ran in Florida for re-election. He won, so I just sent him a little text saying congratulations on on winning, and he said, send me something back saying, love to have you up here, let's talk. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know what, I actually am. I have been thinking about going that route. He brought me into his office and kind of gave me a rundown of you know what it takes and what you got to do. And he set me up with uh, his consultants, and they talked to me a little bit. And like, you know what? Maybe I, I think I can do this. So he gave, he kind of gave me the belief uh, that I, it was going to be possible. That's awesome. All right, let, let me do this. Let me dig into this a little bit because from the outside, what it looks like when we see people entering the political arena, it's like all of a sudden they just kind of magically appear. Right. What what actually happens, you know, when you talk to your friend, when you talk to these consultants and people start looking at you as a potential candidate, what does all that look like behind the scenes, behind the, what do they call the sausage maker, yeah. right? right? You just eat the sausage, but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. What's going on behind the scenes there? Yeah, so I think the way that I'm kind of in a unique position where I'm friends with Brian and he already had some folks that you know, consultant on his campaign that were close friends of his and they had experience, you know, they worked on previous campaigns. They had a lot of experience. They got him elected. But I think the vast majority of the time you, you know, you approach a consultant. There's, it's just a, you know, it's, it's a position. You, you do campaign consulting. That's your business. So that's, that's how they make their money. They make their money through campaign consulting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a business and there's, you know, there's consultants all over the place for everything you want to do Mm -hmm. in the campaign world, getting elected. So, you know, in some cases, it might just be the the consultant, you know, they just want a paycheck. They think they can, you know, get a paycheck. They think they can try and help you. But in a lot of the cases in, in the case here is, I think they look at, you know, whether or not you have a good story, whether or not you, they think you can get elected, and then they kind of believe in you as well. And so I think when they, saw me and I kind of told him about myself. They said, okay, here's a good story Mm -hmm. uh, that we think can get traction. And then the guy's just, you know, he just seems like he's going to be a selfless individual and he'd be a good uh, in Congress. And so those two kind of things combined, I think, in this particular case. But, you know, that being said, there's a dichotomy, of course, on Jocko Podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Just (laughs) Uh, Where there might be, you know, some people that they're just in it for the paycheck too. The this is the consultants are just in it for the paycheck. Sometimes, not all. I mean, or, or I think, they can be. Yeah, they can be. I think the vast majority of the time, you know, they they want to get behind somebody they believe in. What kind of what kind of process did they put you through for vetting you? I mean, like you said, okay, they interview, they know they have a good story. Your story's kind of public, so it's not really hard to figure out. Yeah. Did they get you? All right, we're going to do a Q and A with you. We're going to hammer you with questions. Did they do all that kind of thing? Gig simulator? Yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> I Well, I met with Brian, and then, you know, so obviously he vouched for me. So these two guys that are his friends and ran his campaigns, they I don't think they really needed to vet me too much more after that, after Brian vouched for me. But we did meet up, and we talked a little bit. And I didn't even, honestly, I didn't even know if they were going to help me or not. I thought they were just kind of answering a few questions that I had. But then after that, they uh, they said, yeah, we want to we wanna help you run your campaign. And so, yeah, I think it's just getting a feel, just getting to know somebody. Getting a, It's like, you know, hiring somebody for a job. You get to know who they are, and they just decide if they want to work with you or not. And, you know, I'm lucky enough that they decided they did. And so then so then, what what happens next? Yeah, so what Is happens? Is it a big plan preparation? I mean, imagine yeah. they want the announcement to be a big deal, right? Yeah. So, so how did that, all that go down? Yeah, so I think I decided 
you know, I committed to it and mm-hmm. we started setting things in motion you know, probably in April or something like that, earlier in the year. And they said, okay, so we're going to do an announcement. And so that's kind of a good way to get press and get your name out there. It's all about just getting people knowing who you are and knowing your story so that they can decide whether or not they think that you're a person that they can support. So part of that is making this big announcement because you get a lot of press coverage when you announce officially. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we kind of plan this out. You make a video uh, and you prepare press and you do a little bit of practice with, you know, answering some of the questions you're going to get on announcement day. But mostly it's just about getting kind of the sausage making stuff in place too. You got to fight. You have to. There's all sorts of rules about, you know, with the FEC, the Federal Federal Election Committee or Commission or whatever. Yeah, some really crazy rules. All sorts of rules. So next thing you do is you kind of you hire a. Um, like a, a compliancy guy. I was going to say a legal yeah, team or something. Like kind. somebody that knows how these things work. And then you kind of prepare the paperwork to file. And then you get all these, you kind of get your apparatuses in place. So once you announce, boom, boom, it's like a, an assault. So some of those rules uh, that you have to be compliant with, like you can only take a certain amount of donations, right? I mean, what yeah. there's, and they have to come from certain places. Yeah. So individuals <laughs> can only donate $2,800 per election. And then if there's a primary and a, a general election, so that's $5,600 per mm-hmm. election cycle. But if a person donates $5,600 now, I can only use 2800 of that for the primary. And then the other 2800 I can use in the general election. There's all sorts of rules. And then you can't take money from uh, corporations unless there's – you can take money from a, a PAC, a political action committee. They can only donate 10000 And then there's things called super PACs that – are kind of their own entity. You can't talk with them. They can support you, but you can't talk directly with them. <laughs> so you can't like plan things out with them, but they can kind of pick up on what you're doing in your commercials and your advertisements, and they can kind of intuit what they should do to help your campaign. But you can't work directly with them. So yeah, there's also, and then usually what you'll do is you'll fly me out and you'll pay for a really, really nice hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're talking here. about when you're talking about you, you're saying Jocko podcast. Yeah, when Jocko you come podcast. on before, it's like, hey, yeah, yeah we, we, we fly you out here yeah. and pay for your yeah, hotel. You treat me and, real nice. Uh, yeah, and get you the, dinner or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but since I'm coming and I'm talking about being a political candidate, if I want, if you, if I wanted you to pay for the, for my travel out here, then you'd have to do like some kind of in-kind donation paperwork and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, there's just all of these different rules. So you kind of have to have somebody that you can send an email to really quick. Can we can we do this? And they say, yeah, you probably shouldn't. Or they And they handle the, the filing of the paperwork, and they do all mm-hmm. that. And they handle uh, all my donations that come in because there's so many rules with donations. So all the donations, if it's a check, they go down to this guy where he is. He reviews it, makes sure you have all the stuff. Like over two hundred dollars, people have to report their employment information and that kind of thing. And then so he makes sure you have all the stuff, and he's like, "Okay, this is a valid donation. We donate that." And if one comes in without the right stuff, then he's like, "This is invalid, and you can't have it." How big is the staff that you have? I mean, this sounds like I mean a, a decent sized operation. Yeah, I mean it, it's and right now it's kind of a skeleton crew for the most part. I have my consultants. Uh, who have been with me, you know, since uh, before I even announced. We have the compliance guy. Uh, We have digital consultants that kind of do websites, and they kind of handle some of the digital fundraising stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I have an individual person fundraiser. So this is somebody that knows, has a lot of personal connections, has experience raising money, you know, for political campaigns and other stuff. So I have her. And then she kind of helps me raise with the raising money. And then I also have uh, yeah, the compliance guy. Um, and then eventually you kind of bring on more and more people like a campaign manager and as time goes on. Uh, but, yeah, so you kind of – right now we have a skeleton crew and then we're just going to keep building and building. And and they're obviously raising money is is – Unfortunately. That's basically how you get elected. I mean, in a way, it's it's got to be a giant percentage of the mechanism that gets you yeah. elected. So if you don't get if you don't raise enough money, you don't even get the platform to say what 
for people to hear what it is that you're going to do, what you're going to say, yeah. what your what your beliefs are. Yeah. So you kind of have to get this money raising machine moving. Yeah. So it's more it's more uh, more for some people, less for other people. Important. So the better story you have, the less money you're going to need to get your story out there. And you know, I kind of have an advantage where. People have kind of heard of me, you know. Yeah. Uh, people aren't coming up to me every day and you know asking who I am uh, or anything. But when somebody hears the guy that ran 31 marathons, like, oh yeah, I know that guy. And then so I can kind of put the face to that to that name. Uh, but yeah, so the the big part of it is people knowing that you're running, knowing you exist, knowing enough about you to decide whether or not they want to vote for you. And so you have to look at how well, how, pe- how do people get their information? They get it through watching TV. They get it through doing uh, through reading the paper. They're going online, through podcasts, you know, things of that nature, Facebook ads, things like that. And so all those things cost money. So if you want to, you're not going to go up to, you know, my district has 800,000 people in it. And if I went to every single house for 10 minutes, that's what, 8 million minutes. There's just not that many minutes. <laughs> And so you Man, have you to. You should have run your 31, mar- yeah, 31 marathons around run. in circles around your hood. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's like, how do people get their information? And that's that's the way they do it. All those things, they cost money. And in the DC area, especially, they cost a lot of money. And then in order to get your face and name out there at the most optimum time, the most efficient time, costs even more money. If you want to have your ad on, you know, during Fox News or, or whatever in the morning, that costs a lot more money. So, yeah. So, unfortunately, it's one of those things that you have to raise the money in order to just to get your name out there so people know you exist. So, what is the what is the process from here on out? What does it look like? I mean, take me all the way, well, as the, to the best of your knowledge, what happens next? So, you're, you're obviously, you spend the next however many months raising money to get this thing going forward. What does the rest yeah. of this time look like? Yeah. So, like yeah, what are like, the big milestones along the way yeah, uh, that bring you to election day victory? <laughs> uh, yeah, the money raising now. So, kind of your first quarter that you raise is kind of a bit of an indicator. Like, if you raise enough money in the first quarter, that a lot of people kind of use that as a gauge on how much of a chance you have. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of something. So you want to get you want to have a good raise in your first quarter. When, when did your first quarter start? July first. So it's, it kind of goes on the fiscal quarters. Okay. So July 1st to September 30th. So we're okay. kind of coming up to it. And then I'm kind of at a little bit of a disadvantage because we did our announcement on the same day that I got wounded, which was July 22nd, kind of to make the announcement a little bit more special. Right. And so we kind of- So you gave up a Gave few up like weeks. three weeks, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, so that's one milestone. And then while you're doing that, uh, you're raising money, raising money, and then- How's the it going time, first quarter right now? Uh, it's going pretty good. Are you where good. you want to be? Um, it's been a little bit difficult because there's a lot of different factors. It's summertime, so people are, you know, on vacation. There's also a, a local election in Virginia coming up. So a lot of people are kind of more focused on that. They're not really focusing on next year yet, understandably so. And then at the same time, I don't, I'm not a politician. You know, I have mm. no political mm. apparatus before this. And a lot of people that run for office at this level you know, they've ran for county seat, then they run for state seat, and they run another state seat. Uh, so they have, you know, people that have donated to them consistently over the years, so they can kind of go back to these people over and over again every time they have a an election. Mm-hmm. So they have those people that have already donated, so they can raise God, money kind of quick. I don't have that. Yeah. So I kind of have to build that donor base from scratch. The, we, the other thing that I must imagine is a little bit weird is, like, learning how to ask for Money. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I know I feel weird asking anyone for help in anything, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I would rather just do something myself than have yeah. to say, hey, can I help? Maybe that's an ego thing a little bit of, yeah. hey, I don't need anyone's help. Maybe it's an ego thing of, hey, I don't want to give that person the, the little one up on me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't want to, uh, that's, but, uh, but also, you know, it's just like being self sufficient, right? Yeah. And not wanting to ask for a handout. I mean, even when we started this podcast, there was, the whole, the whole, uh, what is it like? Donation thing was out there, right? It was mm-hmm. out there. It was kind of a thing, and you, and there was a lot of people that that's how they were running their podcasts was by just taking donations, and 
We we actually still have like a little thing where you can you can don't we have something on the website where you can donate through PayPal or something like yeah. that. And we've had a couple so. people that have like that have done that, but we've probably talked about it twice or whatever, yeah. <laughs> like barely ever. Because to me, it feels kind of weird to say, yeah. "Hey, hey, <laughs> can you give me some money?" Right? And and honestly, when when we first started trying to th- when we were first talking about how we would get money to buy what we're do to to support what we're doing. I said, you know, well, maybe we just make some t-shirts, you know, and you're like, yeah, we can make t-shirts all day. Cool. Mm-hmm. Cause that way we're, you know, we're, we're not just saying, give me something, yeah. right? We're saying, Hey, you, you buy this thing and it helps support you. Yes. <laughs> so you gotta, you had to overcome the, the idea of I'm going to ask people for money. Yeah. It's extremely, it, it's very, it's very, weird, very unpleasant. Man. And yeah, so what you do first is you go to friends and family and you say, look, I'm thinking about, that's another one of the rules. You can't say, before you announce, you can't say you're actually running, you can only say I'm strongly considering running for Congress. Would you donate if I do decide to do this, even if you've already you know, decided that you're going to, you can't actually say it because then you technically you have to file. So all you can say is I'm you see, so you go to your mom, your dad, your close friends and family. I'm strongly considering <laughs> running, running for Congress. I'm laughing because in my family, those are the last people you'd be asking for money. <laughs> I don't ask my, you know, that's not happening. We're getting zero from no, friends my and first family. two calls were my dad and then my mom. Yeah, that's so nice. they were yeah they were supportive. <laughs> and then you just kind of slowly call through your friends and family. Like every phone, every phone number you have in your phone. You know, like so I started with kind of people that I talk to regularly. Yeah. You know, would, would you donate? And they say yes. And then you kind of just go through And like, that's kind of weird too cuz now you're like asking the question but not even closing exactly. the deal. So now you're going to go back. You have to what, go back to What's the them. purpose of saying that? What's the purpose just to do you go back to your consultants and say, "Hey, listen, I'm getting a I'm getting a 50% feedback that people will donate?" Yeah, well, the thing about asking people for donations is I had a I had a good buddy uh, named Frank that I called him, I, I I texted him or called him or whatever beforehand. I said, I'm thinking about running for Congress. Will you donate? He's like, oh, yeah, definitely. I will definitely donate. And then I'm saying, okay, well, we're trying to don- I get everybody to donate on Monday. We want everybody to donate on Monday because we want to raise a bunch of money like on day one. So that's kind of a thing in the political sphere. Got You'll it. see like I think recently um, a couple of the Democratic presidential candidates, they announced and they said, oh, and we raised – hundreds of thousands of dollars on day one. And people are like, oh, they think that's really cool and it's kind of a big deal. And so I say, trying to get everybody to donate on Monday, July 22nd, you know, if I run or whatever. Uh, so then my fund, I gave my fundraiser all the text messages that I contacted. She sent them all a text on Monday reminding them, here's the link. And then this guy, Frank, he didn't donate. And then so I called them again, you know, a week later, like, hey, just re- wanted to remind you, you know, I've announced now raising money. And he calls me back a couple weeks later and he says, okay, I finally donated. And I said, and he, 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 uh, now quit he runs, calling me. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Uh, and he runs the rowing program for UVA, the men's rowing program. And so he has to get a lot of donations. And I said, so well, you got any, uh, got any tips for me on, on raising money? You know, how to ask for money. I'm not very good at it. He said, listen, you got to remember I'm a close friend and it took me three weeks and three mm-hmm. reminders to donate to you. So you hit somebody up the first time and they want to do- they they, they yeah. want to support you but you just hit them, you know, when they're about to get in the car or you know they're take dropping their kids off at school or something like that and they just forget, you know. And so you got to remind them again and then so you kind of have to make sure you hit them at the right time where they're okay, I'm just sitting around watching TV or whatever, I'm eating dinner, I can do it right now. So you kind of have to just keep following up with people. Um so you, you uh, friends and family first, and then once you get through all that, then you start kind of calling people that have donated previously. So you kind of you can get these lists. I'm sitting here trying to think if you if what you hit me up for. <laughs> I didn't hit you I, up no, specifically. You, you hit me up. I think you said, "Hey, I'm going to run," or "I'm thinking about yeah. running for Congress." <laughs> Maybe I could come back on the podcast, and I was like, "Oh, absolutely." Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I don't think you actually hit me up for the cash though. I didn't hit you up for the cash because friendship capital. 
like kind of like leadership capital. Okay. Yeah, I figure you're kind of already helping me out. So you you've helped me out so much already with having me on, you know, before the month marathons, after the month marathons, and all that stuff. And now you're going to help me out again with this podcast. And I just kind of figure, you know, I don't want to ask too much of you. Well, right on. Um, but you're not going to get anything if you don't ask. Yeah, exactly. That's all I'm saying over here. <laughs> <laughs> not to mention that. That's the other right thing there. you have to remember too. That you have you have to ask, even though it's uncomfortable. Um. So yeah, then can you, start you sell asking. product? Can you sell a T-shirt and and use that the profits from that? I don't know. I don't. Th- I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to. I'd have to ask. What about personal guy. money? Like you always yeah, hear about so, these rich politicians. They just yeah, gonna spend. You a can bunch sell of fund money. as much as you want. Oh, so you can donate to your campaign as much as as much as you want. But if you're doing, I, I don't. You know, I don't have enough money anyway, so it wouldn't really be a drop in the bucket for me to donate selling all carrots, my savings. Selling carrots yeah. from the farm is <laughs> <It's> not <laughs> enough carrots to pay for this. Uh, uh, we did just start getting eggs, so maybe that'll be, you know, something that we can add to it. But uh, yeah, so I simply just don't have enough money. But yeah, there's some, there's some people that take mortgages out on their homes <clears throat> and they kind of loan the campaign two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 and then... Uh, they get paid back after they really start raising money. I can't do that either because I don't have a mortgage on my home because it was given to me by a wounded veteran charity. So there's no mortgage and I can't take out a mortgage for five years as a part of our contract. Uh, But yeah, so you ask the people close to you, they donate, and then you start kind of going through these lists of people that uh, have donated to campaigns before, they're politically active, a lot of the times they have a little bit more cash to spare. You start calling them, but that's unpleasant too because a lot of the times it's just cold calls. Mm-hmm. And you go, you know, you have is to have Is this your team script. doing this or is this you? This is, yeah, this is me. So with my fundraiser, uh, she just basically just sends me call sheets. So she gets these lists of, it's, it's all publicly available if they mm-hmm. donate over a certain amount. She just goes online, They oh, they, they donated to this other Republican candidate or this other Democratic candidate, so they might like you. So. You just kind of, and there's a bunch of phone numbers on there. And a lot of the times it doesn't work or it's like a main number to their business. And you kind of have to go in and go into the directory and call it. And you call them up and you just go, you know, you do your little 20 second spiel. How many of these phone calls have you made? Oh, and it's like, my schedule is nine to 11 campaign fundraising phone calls, work out at 11, eat lunch at 12, uh, one to three, make phone calls. What are you doing from 4.30 in the morning until 9? 4.30 in the morning until 9. <laughs> Usually f- 4.30 to 6.30, um, uh, cutting sawn logs. <laughs> and then uh, 7 is usually when I start. I'll start reading or I'll start doing some writing, kind of fleshing out my th- thoughts on things. Yeah. And then between 7 and 9, because you can't call people before 9 o'clock yeah. at their so, so So 9 to 11, you're making phone calls. And yeah. then you said from one to three, you're also making phone calls? Yeah, if I have You're just enough. hammering through a list. Yeah, so my fundraisers will send me 20, 25 at a time in these lists, and you just kind of look at it. This what, guy's what's the number. contact rate? Uh, you, you make, very low. If you make 100 calls, how many people do you talk to? I'd say maybe 10, like directly when I call. Yeah. 10% Yeah, tops. I mean, that. I, the the chance of you have of me picking up a phone from yeah. a number I don't recognize is zero. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's zero. And a lot of the time what you do is you call, and the vast majority <clears throat> of the time you're calling their place of work. And so they have an assistant. And so you have to kind of, Get you know, that. You, have to, you have to kind of craft a little script almost yeah. that gets them to, that kind of intrigues them. And it has to be short because it can't be too long. Oh, I, when I first started out, I was doing Let's like this 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear it. All right. So I'll ring, ring, ring. I'll call Echo. Ring, ring, ring. Hello. Oh, uh, hi. This is Rob Jones. Uh, I'm calling for Mr. Charles. This is him. Oh, hi, Mr. Charles. My name's Rob Jones. I'm a wounded Marine from Middleburg, Virginia. And I'm calling him today because I'm running for Congress in Virginia's 10th District. And I was just hoping you might have a few minutes to speak with me uh, about my campaign to see if you might be willing to support me. Yeah, and that's I'd what I say. Yeah, <laughs> pretty straightforward. And that's yeah. it. Yeah, so yeah. <clears throat> I kind of, and it's it's been kind of, and your fundraiser, they're kind of good at that. So they can advise you on what to say. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of, when I first started out, I kind of had like this minute long monologue. They're like, "Hello, hi, I'm Rob Jones, and I ran 31 <laughs> marathons in 31 days, and I did all this stuff." And then like by the end of it, you know, it's they haven't spoken like a minute and a half, bro. Yeah. So you got to bring that do down. It. When yeah. uh, when Leif and I wrote Extreme Ownership. 
and we did our first event that the book was at. And it yeah. was a big event. There was like maybe a thousand to fifteen hundred people there. And we got done, we got off stage, and they had a bunch of books for us to sell and people were gonna buy and then they could we could sign them. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we got off stage, it was like mayhem. Everyone was really <laughs> fired up and here's this brand new book and the big message had just come from us. And so the you know, they got the two little tables for us to sign on. There's a stack of books for us to, to uh, give to the people. And the very first person, and you know Leif, like the joke is that Leif is like a nice person and I'm not, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so the first, and immediately, as I looked at the line, this was, you know, one of the, this is, this is like one of the few things that I'm naturally gifted at, like looking at a scenario and kind of figuring out really quick what needs to happen to, to get this done. So I, I see people lined up and I say to myself, all right, I need to be signing these books as fast as humanly possible. So I immediately start signing the Extreme Ownership book, just own it. Jocko, that's that's all I'm writing. Yeah. So I get like two, three people. Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you, Jim. Jim, own it. Jocko, boom, hand it to life. Boom. Uh, next person. I get through <laughs> five or six people, and and all of a sudden there's all there's a there's a. <laughs> There's a roadblock right next to me. His name is Leif Babin. <laughs> and he's such a nice guy that, you know, he says, hey, Jim, how you doing? Where about you from? And, you know, the person's like, I'm from wherever. I'm from Maryland. Ah, oh, you know, I went to the Naval Academy up there in Annapolis. Man, what a beautiful. So, well, you know, what, what do you do for a living? And he's having a legit conversation. And then he's writing, you know, Jim, so good to talk to another person that, you know, grew up in the fine state of Maryland and I appreciate the support that y'all gave us when I was up there going to the Naval Academy and I hope that everything goes well with your business. Appreciate it. Uh, lead and win. Lay back. <laughs> and man, it, it took him, it was like, it took him, by by the time he, I had handed him the, the, the you know, 17th book and he wasn't done with his first one, <laughs> he just, he started writing lead wins and carrying on. But yeah, you know, it's like the, 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 the ability to really be nice in a situation like that yeah. is a little bit tougher. And also, you know, people, you don't want to waste people's time. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to get to the point, like you said, you got to get, you got to get your, at least the initial message of, hey, this is who I am and this yeah. is what I'm doing and do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I, it's, it's a strange balance because I, I want to keep it short but also say something that makes them give me the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. So it's kind of figuring out what that is and I decided saying I'm a wounded Marine running for Congress, that was kind of a good balance of that. Well, that's a big statement, right? That's yeah. a, You were in the Marine Corps. You obviously have served you have made sacrifices for your country already, and now you're willing to serve more. That's a pretty big, that's a, that's a short yeah. statement, but it's also, it carries, there's a lot of meaning behind it. There's a lot of yeah. weight behind it. Yeah. Okay, so I'm still sitting here thinking to myself, from a efficiency perspective, you don't have some other three people that are dialing through and being like, okay, Rob, we got a live one, boom, and handing you the phone? Not really. I mean, sometimes my, my fundraiser will have relationships with some people, uh, and she'll say, I've already talked to this guy. Uh, just You just got to call him and talk to him for a couple minutes, and he's probably going to donate. But, yeah, I guess, you know, the way that it works is people probably aren't going to talk to you if you don't call them directly. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what. Don't ever – I'll donate to your campaign. Don't give my number to any of those lists. <laughs> I don't want anyone else calling me. <laughs> well, <laughs> depending on how much public, you donate. Right? Yeah. yeah, depending on how much you donate. I, you just put Victory's phone numbers or – Put, yeah, you, know, you got to put a phone number in at there. At some point, and I'm going to try and tell this um, without without dropping any dimes on anyone or anything. But anyways, there was a an organization, and it's not really a charity organization, but somehow I had donated money to this yeah. organization a long time ago. And so they would call me consistently all the time. And when they would call my house, I would put them on speakerphone so my whole family could be entertained by what I would say to them. <laughs> but anyways, they called one time and they say, oh, is this, we're looking for uh, Mr. Willink. I said, yeah, this is, now this is blah, 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 blah. And we're, you know, it's fundraising time again and we're, we're looking to up the numbers this year. And this is when I got them on speakerphone and I don't. I forget the years it was, but the the girl says, and I'm looking at your our records right now, and it looks like the last time you donated was 
eight years ago and you donated ten dollars <laughs> <laughs> and i was like yeah i said why don't you call me in another eight years and we'll, we'll re-up that thing yeah, or something yeah. like that so yeah don't get my name don't yeah, get my no. number on that i list. wouldn't i would never give out uh, anybody's phone number but if they don't if they donate and they right. report it then There's they put less, their own phone number yeah. in there and that's how you get it um but yeah so that's that that's kind of where people are coming from with they get donation calls all the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm just another guy. So you have to figure out how to make yourself unique and get through that kind of guardedness in the very beginning that, you know, they're they're automatically probably going to say, no, you know, I get this is the 50th call I've gotten. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm busy. I'm calling them at work. And these people, a lot of the times, you know, they're a little bit wealthier. So it's not like they just got all their wealth by sitting around watching Netflix. Mm-hmm. You know, they are working. <laughs> no, they they're working hard. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you kind of have to figure out a way. And a lot of the times it'll be, I'll talk to an assistant and then she'll say, well, no, they're not available or they're not here because they're working. And I'll leave a message with her or I'll leave a voicemail on their phone. And then I give it a week. If I have an email address for them, I'll send them a follow-up email and you can be a little bit more verbose in an email. So I kind of like that where I'll, I can kind of mention the 31 marathons and be a little bit more verbose there. Send them a follow-up email. If they don't reply to that, then I'll call them again. You just kind of have to – you have a spreadsheet yeah. of people you call, and you're like, I called them. Okay, I called this person 10 days ago, so today's another good game. And call. what's weird to me is you could call a billionaire who goes, oh, I absolutely want to support yeah. you. You, I'm, I got your back 100%. I was in the Marine Corps. I was wounded as well mm-hmm. in, in Korea or in Vietnam, and I, you got my support. And the all you can get from is 2800 bucks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's really – but it, yeah, in some other elections, like in state elections, if a billionaire likes you, he can give you a billion dollars if you want. But federal elections, you can't do that. Um, so yeah, that's it's and it's tough. So you gotta call and call and call and call, and then you gotta do stuff, you know, to get your name out there. And at some point, will it be? Will someone else start t- making calls for you? Not really. I mean, so Brian, who just continues to help help me in a lot of different ways. He'll make calls like he has he has donors that he mm-hmm. goes to and so <clears throat> lately he's been making a few calls to their donors to his donors and saying you know well let me tell you about this guy rob jones will you consider talking to him and they say yeah sure have him call me so then i call them so mm-hmm. in a way yeah and then if yeah if, i mean if somebody knows somebody that they think would be interested in speaking to me and donating to my campaign they'll call them but a lot of these people um nobody knows and so and a lot of the times my fundraisers, she'll set me up with people that are more likely to, she thinks are more likely to donate. Like I've, I've called several Marines. Yeah. You know, and, or other veterans. And yeah, and so they have that connection with me immediately because we're both veterans. So they're more willing to talk to me. It seems to me like it would be a good idea to get someone else to call for two reasons. Number one, efficiency of your time. Mm-hmm. But number two, it's kind of like it's easier for someone else to brag about you than it is for you to brag about yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, for someone yeah. to call up and say, "Hey, how you doing? My name is Jocko Willink, and I'm actually not calling for myself. I'm calling for a, a great friend of mine that is a, a former Marine. He was wounded in Afghanistan, and he's actually not done serving yet. He's running for Congress here in the great state of Virginia, and I was wondering if you could maybe help out." Or are interested in supporting what he's doing. Like it seems like that would be kind of a good way to do it. Yeah. And no, I agree with you. And you have to have, you know, outside the box ideas like that. Because um, because so, yeah. the instinct is well, because my first instinct is oh, that's awesome that you're doing it yourself. Like that really shows. Like if you personally called me, I'd be more apt. But then I thought about it. Well. Maybe, but someone else calling me and saying, "Hey, this guy's running. He's a great guy." It's sort of a it seems like that would be helpful as well. I'm not trying yeah, to be your no, campaign agree. manager. So the consultants, hey, back off everyone if you're getting all <laughs> mad at me right now. <laughs> no, I, I what totally are you doing? Agree. Tell Rob not to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think the main difference um, is probably that the fundraiser kind of knows that these people might not go for that kind of thing. But God. what you're talking about I think would work great on kind of a more of a grassroots level where you're trying to call a lot of people and get smaller – Donations, yeah. and that's kind of important too. You want to get all those donations as well. Oh, so right now you're going after the big hitters, kind yeah, of. Yeah, you kind of go like these. These calls are people that have donated, you know, a thousand dollars in the past, God, five thousand, yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. 
Um, so those weird. kinds of people usually wouldn't. It's so weird the way these mechanisms work oh, yeah. in the world. Mm -hmm. Like this is, you you set up a system and you have no idea. Like you know you said earlier, you you make laws, but you don't actually know what they're going to do when they hit the yeah. books and when they start getting enacted in the world. This is one of those things. Mm -hmm. Like whoever made these laws, probably or these rules, or when these rules were made, people had no idea how it was going to turn out. What it actually, what that actually translates to in the real world. Yeah. And I'll, one of my favorite examples of that is going through officer candidate school. In officer candidate school, there was things that you did at officer candidate school that had no, there's no possible way that the intention of the drill instructors was to have you doing what you're doing. One of the examples <laughs> is you get a belt buckle. You get a belt buckle that has a coating on it. It's like a shiny brass belt buckle, but it's got a coating on this shiny brass belt buckle that, because you know, brass turns green or whatever real yeah. quick. Well, you get this one that's been treated in such a way that it never will get, it just stays shiny all the time. I mean, you can get thumbprints on it if you stick your finger on your thumbprint, but you can easily wipe it off. Well, you what you do is you have to clean these belt buckles with Brasso until that lining comes off completely. <laughs> and then you end up with a thing that you have to constantly polish all the time and it doesn't hold its shine. <sighs> and you think to yourself, at some point someone said, hey, make sure there's no fingerprints on your brass belt buckle. And so people started cleaning it. And then they started cleaning it until the actual <laughs> finish was off. Yeah. And now this thing has become, become a totally different game, yeah. right? The game is no longer just keep your belt buckle clean. It's go completely psycho with the with with Brasso until the thing is is not even functional anymore. I and mean, when you get done with Officer Candidate School, you throw that thing away because it has no purpose. Yeah, they didn't mean it that way. At some point, somewhere along the way, a drill instructor said, "Hey, you got a thumbprint. Make sure there's no thumbprints on your on your belt buckle." And that it went from that over however many thirty, fifty years to you polish all the finish completely off that thing <laughs> until it's just pure brass. You get all these weird things that happen like that. Yeah. And that's what this is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this environment that's created and all of a sudden you've got these these potential candidates or candidates that are running that are jumping through these random hoops that have been built by random laws that were that yeah. seem to make sense to somebody at some time. Yeah. Well they're not entirely random, but it's they have they have, you know, purposes and theories behind them they want to prevent corruption they won't they don't want you know politicians to be bought off or anything like that um, but then you're never gonna think of absolutely every single contingency that could possibly happen and then so you have the you know these are the rules and then you know human beings we have these big old brains that we can <laughs> adapt to and we people figure out you know ways oh, yeah. to maneuver and you know, this is what you get. And then so you're like, okay, well, you can't do this and this and this. And like, well, they just do it a different way. Yeah. So you can, you know, you, you create a, the best system you can, and then you just have to let people, you know, you obviously always try and improve upon it, but uh, you just have to live within that system. Do you guys do like a like analytics to see, hey, how much are we getting from the calling center? I just feel like door-to-door yeah. -door cold calling, like, is just as time goes on, it's like less and less and less effective. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So we, we keep track. So like everybody that I call, I put in a spreadsheet yeah. and I talk, you know, I put in there the result of the call, what number I called, you know, what day I called them so I can kind of look back. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so we kind of know. And so we can kind of analyze that. Yeah. Um, but kind of as you, as time goes on, uh, a lot of the times it'll get easier to raise money because people see that you're raising money and success breeds <clears throat> success. So they'll check and say, like, oh, this guy's already raised $200,000 or whatever it may be. And then, oh, okay, so he's a viable candidate now, so I'm mm -hmm. gonna actually going to donate to him. And another reason that's kind of hard right now is because we have, you know, there's going to be a primary and a lot of people don't want to support in a primary because these people have money. They want to invest in something that they think is going to, mm -hmm. you know, be fruitful. Off, so yeah. then there's no way to know. And so that's why you kind of have to get your story out there. You have to kind of convince them, you know, why you're a viable candidate and why they should support you. And it's not uh, it's not the most pleasant thing to have to do, and it's not the easiest thing to do. But the more you do it, the more I'm kind of getting used to it now. And I'd rather ask a stranger for money than, you know, ask uh, a close friend uh, for money. 
for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then what's the, okay, so we get we get through this first quarter, ends in September, then what, what's, what, where does the campaign go from there? Do you have any yeah. idea or are you just kind of like on board for the ride? I have, no, I, I have an idea of where it's gonna go, uh, but yeah, I'm not an expert, it's my first time, so. Uh, at the same time as you're raising money in these early stages, you are getting, just getting out and talking to people, going to events. And it's like I've been going to uh, Republican committee meetings and introducing myself. Like a lot of the times they'll allow candidates to come up in the beginning and speak for a few minutes and just so that they know, you know, I introduce myself. And then so you're kind of building that network of people that know who you are and you're creating a little bit of buzz and you're meeting people. And I go out and I talk to a uh, board of supervisors on counties and I just kind of talk and mayors and that kind of thing. And I just say, I just sit down and then what are the, you know, what are the issues that people are talking about here? In Northern Virginia, it's always traffic. This is like number one. And uh, so I just say, well, so what are people talking about? And I just kind of get details on that because these people kind of know, you know, they know the people on a, a granular level because they're local representatives. So they can kind of tell me and then you kind of look at that and then you can kind of see, okay, most of the people are talking about this and this and this. And so you kind of get a feel for that. And then at the same time as you're doing that, you're doing a lot of, you know, research on policy. So you got to read up on, you know, all these different issues that you're finding out that people care about. You got to figure out, you know, what they are, what you can do to change them, what you can do to improve them and that kind of thing. So you're kind of doing all these things simultaneously. And you just kind of go on that trajectory, raise money, meet people, learn policies. When's the primary for you? Uh, so Virginia's kind of unique in that they every year they kind of decide how they're going to select uh, candidates, the Republican Party does, how they're going to select their candidates. So they just recently decided that they're not going to do a primary. What they're going to do is call a convention. And so they're going to have this convention in the 10th District – uh, sometime next year, they haven't set a date for it yet. It'll probably be springtime, spring, maybe early summer, yeah, probably late spring. And what they'll do is they'll bring in all these delegates from all over the counties. The counties send a certain number of delegates in. And what they'll do is all the candidates that want to try and be the, uh, the Republican candidate, they'll get up and they'll speak in front of the delegation. And then the delegates will go vote. And then if they don't have over 50%, if one person doesn't have over 50%, they'll knock off to the bottom one or the bottom two, and they'll vote again. Hmm. And they'll keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. And then at the end, they'll send white smoke out of the <laughs> the top of the building. Uh, no. But they'll have – so eventually it'll be one person versus one person, and somebody will get the majority. And then that's the person. That's it right there. And Is, How many other people are, are going in the 10th district against you? Do you know right, right now? Right now there's one. Uh, one other guy, Army veteran. Uh, but there's always rumors. I mean, there's always other people that, you know, come in. And so there's rumors about other people that are thinking about coming in. But until they file, you don't know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just conjecture. Um, so you know, now that this just got recently to, uh, decided on the 5th, so now that we have that kind of a situation, that's good and bad for us. Um, you know, unlike Musashi, I have no preference. I'll just do whatever the system is. That's what it is. Okay, cool. We're going to mm-hmm. adapt to that. But uh, it's good for us because it requires less money. So you don't have to go uh, out there okay, and do yeah, commercials yeah. for the primary and that kind of stuff. You don't have to do a lot of advertising. You can save all your money for the general election. And when you're running against an incumbent, they already have millions and millions and millions of dollars. So you're going to be coming from a, from a deficit uh, compared to them. So that's good. I can kind of save a little bit of money. Uh, but it's also – a little bit more difficult because now you have to go out and you have to kind of con- you have to find out who the delegates are, and they make a list of it. But you have to kind of talk to these delegates, mm-hmm. and you have to convince <clears throat> them why you're the you're the best person. If you don't have make a good impression on this one person, well, they might not. You know, that's a vote lost, and so there's only so many delegates that you can talk to. So yeah, it's kind of pros and cons with it, but that's what we're doing, and so that's what I'm adapting to, and that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna make happen. And that's not even – we don't even know when that's going to happen right now. Sometime It'll be in, in spring, yeah, 2020. Okay, spring of 2020. Yeah. Do you get will, – will you be making a speech at that thing straight up? Yeah. Like, I mean, hey, I think is, so. That's what I've been told anyway. Um, I guess they 
they have to come up with all the rules and everything of how it's going to work. <laughs> well, I guess they have rules in place, but they have to like release them so God. you know. I'm sure there's you know you have to file as a candidate and all this stuff you know at the at the convention. But I think what the what the guy told me that I talked to said is that they're going to do it where each person gets up and gives a stump speech before they start voting. But a lot of the work is going to be done before. Ideally, you will have all your votes before you even ever give that speech. You're going to do the legwork. It. It's kind of like, you know, this is actually something that Pam says. And she's a, you know, four-time world champion, two-time Paralympic champion. So I should probably listen to what she says about uh, competing. She says uh, the race is won not on the day, mm -hmm. but in the months and years that you spent training beforehand. So you got to put in the legwork, talk to these delegates, and you can even – convince friends of yours to go try and be delegates. <laughs> like, so you can kind of, that's legit. you know, get a, a team move. together. I like, like that move. Yeah. Get a team together to go there and try and become so, delegates. And so <laughs> they're your friends. So they'll vote for you. So you have to kind of do that legwork in order to hopefully win the, the vote before you even give your stump speech. Uh, this is a, uh, one, one of the things I was thinking about as, you know, when we start talking about politics and, in your case in particular, one of the things that comes up all the time in politics is gun control and all those issues. One of the things I was thinking about is your, you went to Virginia Tech, mm -hmm. April 16th, 2007, there was 32 people killed in a mass shooting there. Yeah. W were you on campus when that happened? No, I was, uh, I was in deployed? my apartment. Oh, you were? Your, yeah, oh, it, was okay. my, it was during my senior, senior year, so I was there ish but i was in an apartment off campus i just lived there and when we got the first reports uh it was kind of like they were just saying that somebody was roaming around campus you know shooting people so me being <laughs> just you know graduated from boot camp not too long before so i like immediately like, i'm gonna go over there so i you know i walked over to campus to see if like without any kind of protection or anything to see if i could find this guy or whatever Walked around a little bit, but, you know, I didn't see anybody because, you know, it was all happening in the building and it was all over by the time I even left my apartment. And, yeah, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there, there, you know, I was nowhere near the the, the shooting, but I was there for the, you know, the aftermath and the, you know, just the pain that we felt as a community after the fact. What was the, what was the uh, atmosphere afterwards? I mean, yeah, what did they do with the students at school? Did you guys? I mean, what do you do with a, a you know, a test you have on on Wednesday? What, just yeah. like the basic life stuff. Yeah, what'd it's, they do? it's just disbelief. You know, you can't believe that it happened at all, uh, and you can't believe that it happened to you. You know, to your community. And yeah, it's just one of those. I think they, you know, they they just have to give you time they give you they give you know gave everybody the week off there yeah, the school i think did a really good job of supporting the students in, in my opinion um you know they said no pressure they actually came out and said if you want to you don't have to finish the semester if you don't want to you can just cut your grades here and your teacher or your professor will you know have a grade for you based on what you've done to this point and you don't have to uh you don't have to finish the year if you don't want to and so they gave them that option. They had, you know, support available to to anybody that was, you know, was struggling with with dealing with the situation. They made that available. You know, memorials, it's like there's not a whole lot. You can't the – only, the thing that everybody wants you to do is go back in time and have somebody tackle that guy, you know, before he ever did anything. Um you know, not to make it about me, but the way I felt about I felt I felt guilty that I wasn't in the building. You know, that's how I kind of felt about it. Like maybe I could have been in one of those rooms and ran at the guy and, and I don't know, given given people some time, you know, like a lot of people did. You know, there was one professor that was a Holocaust survivor, slammed the door, blocked it, and I think he had his students crawl out the window or something. And he gets, you know, he got killed by the by the shooter. And so that's kind of how I felt at the time about it. Uh, I wish I had been there to maybe do something, but it's mostly just you just you know you, you just can't believe it. It's it's kind of indescribable. It's an interesting idea of giving uh, when you first said oh they they gave people the option of of 
just taking your grade right there, whatever it happened to be at that time, and then you don't don't have to finish the semester. And at first, I thought to myself, yeah, that's a really good idea. And then as I thought about it, sitting here as you were talking, that what what that does, what that could do to people is okay. Now, what are you going to do? So now, what do you do? You yeah, know, you, you sit there and you start to dwell on this, and you that seems to me like a, a good idea. That in practice, the best thing to do, not the best thing to do, but well, I think it's the best thing to do. Is okay. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna get a week off, right? Yeah. Maybe we're gonna get two weeks off, but we're gonna get a week off. We're gonna hold ceremonies. We're gonna mourn, and then we're gonna get back to work, and we're gonna carry on. And be, because otherwise, you're stuck with just the thoughts of the loss that yeah. you've suffered. And it's one of those weird things. And uh, you know, when you say <laughs> when you say that you that you need to move on, right? Mm-hmm. It sounds like the coldest, most horrible thing that a person could say. If you, if someone loses a loved one and you look at them and you say, well, you know, you've got to move on, right? And, and that's like, that seems like the most horrible and cold thing to say. Yeah. Hey, you've lost a loved one, but guess what? You got to move on. It, it, that sounds so horrible, but it's, it's kind of what you need to do, right? Yeah. I mean, you, it's what you need to do. Your your loved one that you've lost, they don't want you to sit around and mourn for seven months while you wait for the semester to end, for summer to end, and then you go, what are you gonna do during that time period? Yeah. And so that's a rough thing to think about, but I think it's, it's definitely one of those hard things that you have to, the hard conversation that you have to have and sometimes you have to have that conversation with yourself is when you say to yourself or you say to someone else you got to move on and it seems so cold and heartless but at the same time it's what you actually do have to do yeah and yeah I never actually thought about it from that perspective in terms of you know them allowing people to to you know, cut the semester short, but yeah, you know, that's a really good point. You have to have something to do, otherwise, you're just going to sit around and just think about it all day, all the time. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they didn't want people's grades to be affected by, be negatively affected by, you know, yeah, for tragedy sure. like that. So no, it's you can kind of see where they're coming from for sure. Tough decision to make. Tough decision to make. Yeah, I don't know. You know, another thing that that's that I've definitely thought about since you you know entered into this arena is thinking about thinking about Lewis Puller Jr., right? Yeah. Running for running for the House of Representatives in the first dict- district of Virginia. He yeah. ran as a Democrat. Mm-hmm. He as we know lost the election and he lost it to basically a Republican kind of war hawk. Yeah that had the draft deferment multiple times, so so didn't go to Vietnam, but was kind of, you know, a, a war hawk type guy. Yeah. And one thing that's really interesting when you read um, Fortunate Son is that there was all these opportunities that Lewis Puller Jr. had to kind of start negative campaigning mm-hmm. against his opponent, and he didn't do it. And he ran that campaign with as much dignity and class as you, as a, as a person could run. Yeah. And and he lost. And he lost by a big, big margin too. I think he lost by like twenty five percent. Yeah. Which is crazy to think about. Mm-hmm. Are you thinking about right now what it looks like where where your own personal line of Hey, this is too far, and I'm not going to go there. You have to, yeah. You have to maintain your moral compass, and you want. I want to win, but I want to win in the way that I set out to win. I don't want to win by being somebody that I'm not. I want to win by being the person that I am. And then, if people want that person to represent them in in Congress, then I'd be honored to do that. But if the person I am, the people decide that they don't want that in Congress. You know, fair enough. I understand. No hard feelings. I still love this area. I still love the district. This is where you get into a little slippery slope possibility. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah. Because here's the question you can ask yourself is, listen, I'm Rob Jones. 
I know I want to do the right thing for the right reasons. In order for me to have that possibility, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get a little bit medieval on some people here, right? Yeah. And and you think, okay, as soon as this is over, though, I'll go right back to, you know, being on the moral high ground. But if I if I stay on the moral high ground this whole time, there's I might not even get there. Mm-hmm. So I need to position my like. There's a slippery slope there mm-hmm. yeah. where you say, you know what? I gotta make. I gotta. I gotta run this negative ad. I gotta do this. I gotta make this statement about my opponent. Right? That stuff. Or or I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get the publicity that I need to win. That's a slippery. That's a slippery slope. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's the uh, the gray area that a lot of elections are are won and lost in and. You know, maybe we should write a book after this called The Dichotomy of Politics, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's just, yeah, you have your, you know, kind of so-called default aggressive type of opinion or position on that default, you know, good guy or whatever it may be. But then, yeah, you have kind of some some gray areas there where, yeah, if the election's going bad and you feel like this person is really going to be bad for, for the country and for the district, then you might have to do something that you wouldn't normally do, but you kind of maintain that moral compass even with that. Mm-hmm. So you take it to a certain level and then you dial it back and you don't do it again and you don't let it kind of slip away mm-hmm. and, and keep doing it. So you kind of have to take every situation as it's your own unique situation and kind of step out and then step back. Mm-hmm. Step out and step back as needed, I guess. I think that in the end with situations like that what it what you have to maintain above all is you have to maintain the truth mm, yeah. right and if you maintain the truth about what's happening i think in the in the lo- in the long run and oftentimes in the short run hey if you're telling the truth about what's going on you, that's what that's what yeah. will make you win yeah very true yeah you can kind of go negative you can say something that's bad about the other person but you can just say oh well this negative ad is uh, this person voted for this bill that did this, yep. and that's kind of going negative. But it's not you're not you know you're not yeah, insulting you're, you're, them as a person, yeah, you're and you're saying, telling the truth. Yeah. You're not you're not making yeah, something up. Yeah, no, that's up. good. That's a good that's a good way to approach it. I'll I'll let you know how it how it goes when I start having to make those types of decisions. Yeah. Hopefully, it's so obvious that I'm going to win that I won't even have to make those decisions. But we'll, well see. Uh, you know, and and that's the other weird thing about politics is, you know, I I used to think of the officers that were in the military. And most of the time, much of the time, the officers that you wanted to work for were the kind of officers that didn't really care is not the right word, but I'm not sure how to explain it. Didn't really, they they weren't all jazzed up because they were an officer. Yeah, They were jazzed up to work with the troops. They were jazzed up to serve the country. They weren't they weren't doing it for their own career, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with politics. If you think about the type of people that you would actually want to have in political power, one of the main reasons why you would want them in that position is because they would never want to be there. They're the type of people that say, well, they're they're people like you that say, hey, listen, this is not what I want to do, but this is kind of what I have to do. This is the yeah. void of leadership, and 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 someone needs to fill that void. Yeah. So there's a another kind of dichotomy there, that the person that you would actually want in that position is the person that fundamentally, in their own heart, doesn't really want that position. Yeah. And you you end up with, and it's sort of like in in Man's Search for Meaning, the book about the concentration camps. And he says that the best of us didn't make it. The best of us didn't survive Mm -hmm. because the best people in the concentration camp, the purest and most good people were the people that said, hey, you take this crust of bread instead of me. Hey, you take, I'll step up and do this labor that's gonna push you over the edge and make you sick. I'll give you my blanket at night because we only have one for, for four of us and you're the one that needs it the most. Those good people, they didn't survive. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, it's kind of what happens in politics or it could very well, it happens in many cases in politics where the person that won't cross that line, the person that doesn't just look out for themselves first, that's the person that 
doesn't win because they they didn't go negative, they didn't mudsling, they didn't undermine, mm -hmm. and and they end up not winning. So this is a a tough situation, but I think what's good is I think there's more opportunity now, and I think there's a lot of things out there that level the playing field, and I think one of them is social media, right? This oh, yeah. just like this podcast. Okay, you're on here, you get to tell, you get to talk about people know your story, they hear it on a broad basis. You know, you're you got your own social media that you can talk directly to people and there's no filter. It doesn't cost any money to put up a social media post. Now, yeah. does it cost money to advertise a social media post? Yes, it does. It does. So mm -hmm. if somebody can dump more money into that, but at least the playing field is more level than it used to be for you to get your voice out there and not have to do slimy, shady things to do it. Yeah. And then, yeah, with with respect to what you're saying about, you know, some people didn't survive, you also have to wonder whether or not a lot of the times or some of the times surviving isn't always the best thing. So if you have to do something to just to survive and it's something that's even worse than death, then sometimes you don't want to survive. And yeah. sometimes you can be fine with that. And so it's kind of the same thing with, with political. If I have to sling mud and, and do all that stuff, then maybe that's maybe that's not worth it. Yeah, I don't know. no, I, I, I totally agree. All right, you wrote a little something about leadership and it's, I'm just gonna kind of read some chunks of it here. There's a void of true leadership in Congress. It is blatantly ev evident in all the modern forms of media, print, broadcast, and social. It, pat it is patently obvious that the words and behaviors of many of our elected representatives at all levels and in all political parties. One needn't look further than this void to identify the root of the rotten climate in politics that is sickening the American public. There's a big chunk of the American public that are sickened by that. There's a big chunk that actually just full on participates too. Yeah, it, that's true. It, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, I'm not too, uh, I'm not an active participant in Facebook. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have Facebook and I post on Facebook, but I don't, I don't get involved much in um, like the personal Facebook, right. right? Yeah. But I hear stories about Facebook from people that are on it. it it's like a crazy battleground. Yeah where people unfriend you if you make a <laughs> statement or you like someone's political post that they don't agree with. Yeah. It's like crazy people, crazy people. Yeah. But I like to, I, you know, I believe, I truly believe that those people are the minority, the vast minority. I, I agree with you. And I, I said this, um, I said this on a podcast interview. Someone's like, well, there's all these extremists out there. And I was like, you know what? I travel the country all the time. I work with businesses of all sizes. This is, oh, yeah, this is Ben Shapiro's podcast. I, I, I travel the country. I'm all over the place all the time. I work with all these companies. I, I work with frontline troops. I work with yeah. le mid-level leaders. I work with CEOs. I work with everyone in the spectrum. And, and I don't meet people regularly that are like that. I don't know who those people are that are going crazy on Facebook. I don't meet them, I know they're out there. Yeah. But yes, you're right, and I agree with you. Most people, what are they trying to do with their life? Oh, they, they, they're trying to earn money, they're trying yeah. to raise their family, they're trying to spend time with their family, they're trying to pay off their house, like that's what they're doing. So yes, I agree that I think I will kind of retract my statement a little bit in saying that you say it's sickening to the American public. I think most people in the American public are Definitely sick of it. And that's what I said to Ben Shapiro. I said, Ben, I mean, he is at, he is at, what is it called? Uh, he's at ground zero yeah. for political fire, you yeah. know? And, uh, and you know, I was on another guy named Brian Koppelman's podcast, and he's like the other end of the spectrum. And actually, we joked about the fact, you know, I was like, if you met Ben Shapiro, you'd like him fine. He's a really nice guy. Yeah. And Brian Koppelman's like, well, that, that, that's cool. That makes sense. But they're, they're completely opposite ends of the, of the political spectrum. But I, I think that those people at the far, far ends, and, and both those guys can be a little bit of ground zero for, mm. you know, impact and people guilt going crazy. Yeah. 
there's people that like to just stir things up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's people that like to stir things up. Most people oh. like to stir things up in one way or another. Okay. Not huh. necessarily politically, specifically. Some people politically, but in one way or another. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's fun. Not to do it, but to see it happen. Yeah. So some people, they like to take part, you know. All right, moving on with this this uh, piece you wrote. The legislative branch of the United States government is comprised of 535 legislators. Many of them have begun venturing down a path that can only be characterized as the opposite of true leadership, a path that displays a lack of respect for anyone with a different worldview from them, a path that involves de dehumanizing and demonizing s people simply because they are a member of an opposing party. Many of these legislators have stopped viewing people as individuals and have instead applied a group identity and used it to apply group blame. Yeah. That's a Jordan Peterson line that I kind of stole. I heard him say that one time I thought it was a really good line. Well, the, the, that is a true statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And notice I said many. I didn't say all or anything mm -hmm. like that either because it's kind of what we were talking about just now. The Maybe sometimes you only think that the vast majority of people are doing it because they you only hear about the people that are that are being you know kind of naughty or whatever <laughs> so yeah so it can be it maybe it can be said that maybe it's the minority of legislators that are you know kind of under going under this kind of behavior mm -hmm. but i think it's there's a trend starting to happen where more and more and more it's it's happening yeah and so you also get you also get the mob mentality just a straight up mob mentality yeah. where it's blood in the water and the sharks are going to go crazy. And who was it? It was um, Dave Chappelle. I, was, I saw a little clip of Dave Chappelle's um, new Netflix special. Mm -hmm. And he's making this joke. He says, he says, uh, guess who I am? And if you do something wrong ever in your life, and I find out about it, I don't care if it's in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, if I find out about it, I'm gonna ruin everything you have. And he says, guess who I am? And people are yelling out different names. And he goes, I'm you. Right, yeah, <laughs> That's what that. everyone does. <laughs> That's what everyone does nowadays. So we get this mob mentality of, oh, you made a mistake or you said something that was out of line or, Whatever the case may be, cool. Yeah. We're gonna crucify you now. Yeah. That's what. That's so. That's what's gonna happen. Yeah. And unfortunately, in Congress anyway, they're all kind of peers. They're all kind of equals. So there's no one leader that can kind of come in, like at the My Lai massacre, and put in, uh, put a stop to mm -hmm. things. Um, so yeah, there's there's nobody that that can really step forward and do that. And yeah. has that kind of influence. Uh, unless you just take the moral high ground, and people start to see that that's the correct yeah. example. Yeah. So you kind of have time. to start. Leading, yeah, laterally, and I think like Dan Crenshaw is doing a great job of that. He, yeah, he he's just responds. He's not emotional. Mm -hmm. He just kind of you know states his opinion, recognizes that there's other views, tries to explain around it, doesn't get personal with people. He's just doing a great job from that perspective. Yeah, doesn't get fired up. Normal yeah. face. Does, just keeps normal face all the time. Yeah. He's not getting crazy, and and you know it's 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 hard. I remember explaining this when we got home from Ramadi. You know there was. Uh, in inside the SEAL community, there were some people that were looking at the operations we did and what we did that thought, oh, why were you guys going out in the daytime? Why were you guys supporting conventional operations? You know, they were asking these questions. And and basically, it's, it's my fault that they were asking those questions because it means that I didn't do a good job of letting the community know why exactly we were in that position, what the strategic impact of those missions were and all those things. But I remember talking to Leif and Seth because, I mean, coming home from Ramadi, you know, we suffered some significant casualties. And to hear someone say, you know, what were you guys even doing? It's real easy to get emotional. And I sat those guys down. I'm like, listen, when you discuss this with people, if you get emotional, your, your argument goes out the window. Mm -hmm. Because now you're just, they're looking at you going, oh, he's super emotional. That's the only reason he, he's, he, he, it doesn't make any sense. We can't listen to what he's saying because he's emotional. Yeah. And so I said, when you when we talk about this with people, we have to just get unemotional, just detach and just explain, hey, this is what we were doing, here's what was going on, this is what the conventional forces were doing, this is what the strategy was, here's how we were able to help. You just have to do it like that, because if you go, what are you talking about? And another thing that's really easy to do is you weren't even there, like yeah. get really fired up. And we can't do that. So I think Dan is doing a good job of that, and hopefully, 
that example will continue to spread and I know you'll you'll be doing that as well. All right, moving down. The path leads to an endpoint of limited to no effective communication. A lack of communication produces an environment in which no meaningful work can get accomplished. A workless environment in Congress means that America will stagnate. The process and systems on which our country runs will not be able to improve. The result is that Americans will suffer. Yeah. People can't even talk. People can't even talk to each other. Yeah. In Congress. Yeah. And if you can't communicate, by the way, it's crazy. Like you can't. The 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 fact of the matter is that the vast majority of the time it's going to be, you know, close to fifty percent Democrat, fifty percent Republican, mm-hmm. and you rely on these other people to pass legislation and to do the job of Congress, which is to pass bills that can improve. America improves the lives of Americans. So if people can't communicate, so I could have, I could go into a committee or whatever with the cure for cancer. Like this bill will cure cancer guaranteed, even if it is, you know, what I said before where you don't know, I I know for sure Mm -hmm. this will cure cancer. But I go into committee that day, the week before, you know, Representative Charles, I went on Twitter and I said, what an idiot. <laughs> this guy's stupid. You know, I just did a tweet like that. Yeah. He's not voting idiot, for the cancer Not care. voting for it. All his friends aren't voting for it yeah. because they're on his team. So that cancer bill, it's even though it's going to cure cancer, it's going to be the best thing ever, doesn't see the light of day. So it's like you might as well not even have it. Continue on, but there is hope. Despite them getting next to no coverage in the media, there are true leaders in Congress. We can learn from their example. A true leader recognizes that every person comes from a unique set of experiences, including their upbringing, education, struggles, and environment that forms their worldview, including values, priorities, and perspectives. The leader also recognizes that even if an individual's an individual person's worldview is wholly opposite than that of the leaders, it is nevertheless equally valid and worthy of consideration. The leader knows that the worldview and the person must be shown respect. The leader gives the other person the benefit of believing that they have good intention and and thoughtfully analyzes their ideas before coming to a conclusion as to their viability. I, I gave an answer, I think it was at the last muster. Somebody asked this big crazy question about leadership, blah, 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 what are you doing this? And and I said, oh, you know what you do with that? And, and one of the most underutilized tools in all of leadership is to listen. Actually listen to what other people are saying. Mm-hmm. Actually listen to the people below you in the chain of command. Listen to people above you in the chain of command. Listen to your, if you're in a family, listen, listen to what your wife, listen to what, actually listen to what people have to say. And that's what you're saying right here. Instead yeah. of as soon as your mouth opens up, I already am judging what I think you're gonna say and shutting it down, is that I actually listen. I always, when I'm listening to people, I always think, why, I don't, I don't, my, my first instinct when you start saying something isn't, why are you wrong? (laughs) My instinct is, hey, what does this person know that I might not know? Mm -hmm. What, what is it, what, what about this person's perspective is correct that, that doesn't make sense to me or that I don't understand? Continuing on, a true leader of Congress recognizes that America relies on the teamwork of people with opposing viewpoints. The idea of a republic is not to have 51% of the people cram an idea around the throats of 49% of the people, nor is it the opposite. It is to find solutions that as many people as possible can be happy with when they go to bed at night. The leader knows that the only way to achieve this is through working together. And I think that's, you would think that that was a common sense statement, hey, somewhere there's a happy medium that will work for a majority of the people, Yeah, right? It's not way over here, and it's not way over here. There's a little dichotomy between those two that you have to balance as a leader. Yeah, anymore it's like everybody on either side is like, don't move an inch, don't give up an inch. (sighs) Yeah, It's like this country was founded on something called the Great Compromise Yeah, back in, you know, when they were writing the Constitution. Yeah, well that idea of that every single thing is a slippery slope is something that's very hard to contend with, Yeah. right? And I think the reason it's so hard to contend with is that folks on the extremes are so ravenous 
that when they do get an inch, they go, cool, we got an inch. We need to take a foot. And we got a foot. Now we'll take a yard. And so both sides have that attitude. Yeah. Instead of someone coming to the table, putting their ego in check and saying, okay, you know what? We we trust that you'll do this. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that makes America stable is that it's a tough, it's a big bureaucratic system that's hard yeah. to move, right? It's a big bureaucratic system that's hard to move. Mm-hmm. No one person has a massive effect. They just don't. Yeah. I mean, like, you can steer some stuff. You can make some things happen. You can make some, you can put some laws into place, but those laws might get repealed. I mean, it's a hard yeah. place to move around. Mm-hmm. And if people understood how hard it is to move around, then maybe they can start looking at other viewpoints a little bit more. Like let's find, let's actually move forward. Yeah. In some direction. That teamwork relies in turn on communication between these people. The leader knows the leader knows how to effectively communicate with both people that agree with them and those that don't. They communicate directly with the person. They explain their side and genuinely attempt to understand the other person's with humility, with respect, without insults. They don't sling mud in the public space effectively forever alienating that person on whom they rely for teamwork. A true leader acts selflessly in the performance of their duties. They make the decisions and implement the the actions that they truthfully think are the best in the best interest of the people that they represent and of America. They do so even if the result is damaging to their career. They don't care about notoriety and are happy to happy in the simple knowledge that the people that do know them believe in them wholeheartedly and they are making a difference. The good news is that we have leaders like this throughout our country, some are in Congress, but if America is going to continue to be the greatest country on earth, Congress needs more. pretty straightforward yeah i mean we need people to step up uh and that's yeah we talked about it before that's why i've decided to do it uh you somebody has to be the one to uh enter into the arena and it's better to have somebody that has this kind of attitude Mm -hmm. i think um than allow somebody else to do it and i think something those people with this attitude are going to be able to, need to prevail, and we need to move away from the extremist viewpoints that come out, uh, even in Congress. Because it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough question. Well, the one, the when you say that you look at the other people as if their intentions are good, right? Yeah. And that you look at them to someone else and go, hey, look, what they want is what's best for America. And that's a very pure way to look at it. I will tell you that I've talked to some smart people that look at some people in politics and say they have, and I've I've discussed this on a podcast, I'm trying to think of with who, but there's people that think, no, they don't actually want the best for America. Mm -hmm. Or their vision of America is, is different and outside what, what the constitution says. <laughs> yeah. So there so that's another thing to think about. And I think that this this attitude of people going into congress that will actually listen well, this is what I think will happen. The people that will go into congress that actually listen that actually can have meaningful conversations. I think that I, or my hope is that that attitude will begin to rise to the surface that people realize that what you want, you know, uh, the very first podcast I interview I ever did was with Tim Ferriss and he asked something about leadership. Then I talked about humility and then I talked about being balanced. Mm -hmm. And I think what people hopefully in America will start to realize is that what we want is not, are not people on the extremes, but people that are balanced and can communicate and listen, which is, what you are bringing to the table. Yeah, and the reason that a lot of the times people get elected that have these kind of extreme views is because it gets coverage, it gets their name out there, people find out who they are, and what they're saying kind of scares the person and the person's kind of reacting you know, from that fear. And so I think, you know, 
that I have a little bit of an advantage here where I can be kind of with this attitude and I can still get coverage because, you know, I am a wounded veteran and mm-hmm. I've, I've done so much service and I've done all these things that I've done. So people are more likely to want to, you know, tell my story because, you know, it's a r- relatively compelling story. It's a very compelling story. I was talking to Travis Mills the other day and unfortunately we didn't have time to do a podcast, but um, we were talking about stuff and I was like, well, you know, you have a great story and it's the same thing I feel like yeah. in saying to you like, man, you, you've got a good story, right? You've got a great story. And you think, well, and I said halfway through this conversation with Travis, I'm like, hey, bro, I just want to let you know, like, I get that it's not exactly your great story <laughs> that, you know, you got blown up and lost both your legs and both your arms. And even same thing with you, like, hey, and you're saying it too. You're like, hey, I've got a good story. And yeah. it's like, okay, I just want to let everyone know, I get that <laughs> losing both your legs in Afghanistan is not exactly a good story. However, what you've yeah. done with it has, you've taken what would be in many cases a horrible story yeah and you actually truly have turned it into a good story which is exactly what which is exactly what travis does well it's a good story overall with a really uh bad inciting incident yeah and so that's what it is you know the the whole story isn't that one day it's what happens afterwards and so that's the story but there yeah that doesn't mean there's bad there's not bad things in that story but overall you know, it's probably, I, I don't know how Travis feels. Maybe I'll ask him uh, if I ever meet him. But if you asked me, uh, if I went back in time and you asked me a week after I got hurt or a couple hours after I got hurt or whatever, whenever I woke up, you know, would you go back in time and not step on that idea? I'd say, oh, definitely. I'd go, I'd just say, let's not even go through this area. Let's go around. But, you know, I'm in my house now and, you know, Here's a big announcement. We got a baby on the way, me and Pam. Oh, yeah, Yay. thank you. Uh, so we have a baby coming. There's the real announcement. Yeah, there's the real <laughs> announcement. I, I should have said that earlier. Um, got a little boy due in February, and uh, we got this nice house. I have a great life, you know. Um, I think about that, and if somebody asked me right now, if you asked me if I would go back in time and not step on the ID, I'd be like, hell no. I would step on that IED a thousand times to be where I am today. And I think that's important to remember about, you know, so it is a good story. If you can have that attitude at the end of it, that's a good story. There's no doubt about that, man, dang. Um, You know, as we were talking about leadership and and I was reading through some of the stuff you've written, I could not help myself but to refer back to the United States Marine Corps leadership traits. Of course. And, And these traits, are in, originally I think I think the first place that I saw them is in the Marine Corps War Fighting Publication Six Tac Eleven, which is called Leading Marines, and it's in a bunch of other. They 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 quote this all the time. Yeah, they quote this all the time. The the particular comments that I have around it here came from the Commander's Leadership Handbook, which was came. It's a Marine Corps publication. It's not an it's not an official uh, publication, but it's something that they put out in 2016 and they made some comments around around the US Marine Corps leadership traits JJ did tie buckle right what's that called when you do that is it called a, a uh, like acronym a mem- oh, yeah it's an acronym i guess yeah. but it's also an easy way to remember things so they got these oh. they got these uh, certain words that's what it spells out it spells out JJ did tie buckle I bet it's a buckle that has all the brass rubbed yeah, off it Yeah, probably. <laughs> First one is justice. Practice being fair and consistent. Base rewards and punishment on merit. Just straightforward. Fair yeah. and consistent. Judgment. And this is, this is, again, as I was thinking about these, thinking about you, thinking about where you're going, thinking about what your attitude is. Here's what they say about judgment. Consider all sides of an issue before making a decision. G. What a what a shocking idea! Yeah, <laughs> that we would actually consider all sides of an issue before making a decision. And as a leader, clearly that's something. It's it, it's interesting, right? You think to yourself, judgment means I make good decisions. That's what judgment means. Mm-hmm. I have good judgment. But what they're saying is judgment is you actually just consider the different angles before you make a decision. They're talking about how you come to that decision. Yeah. Yeah, and how do you come to that decision? By listening. Yeah. That's how you come to that decision. Dependability. 
Here's a good one. Be on time, never make your Marines wait on you. What a stroke of leadership genius that is. <laughs> never let your, never make your Marines wait on you. And, and that is something that you see with leaders as they get advanced, as they get promoted, and all of a sudden they don't think they need to be on time anymore. Mm. They think that everyone is there waiting for them. And that is just a, a horrible example to set be dependable, meet deadlines, ensure paperwork is processed efficiently and effectively in order to best care for your Marines. Mm -hmm. We're here to take care of our Marines. And again, you take this and you apply this to your attitude going into Congress, what are you there for? To take care of your constituents. Yeah, and they're depending on me to do that, so I have to be dependable to them. If they had to double check my work all the time, you know, that's kind of the the whole purpose of a representative you know, governmental system is that we're trusting, we're depending upon this one person to represent our, you know, our issues and what we need. And so if they had to be double checking me all the time, then they might as well just, <laughs> they, they, they're not going to have any time because it's a full-time job to figure out all the different stuff about all these issues and figure out what to do and go in and yeah. vote and all that thing. So they wouldn't be able to work. They just, everybody would just be a representative and nobody would ever get anything done besides running the government. Which so, would not work. Yeah. By the so way. they have to depend. <laughs> they have to depend on that person. Next up, integrity. The most important ingredient of leadership: tell the truth to both your superiors and your Marines. There you go. We we we, we talked about truth already. Always use your authority for mission accomplishment, not for personal gain. Mm -hmm. That would be a big one to run across uh, the the entire United States government. How much? How many people do things for their personal gain and not for? Yeah, you wonder the good of the country. You wonder how how many people are just concerned about having a political career, and I'll say right now, I'm willing to sacrifice any kind of political career to do the right thing. You know, I'll I'll find something else mm -hmm. if that's what it takes. <laughs> I'll run fifty marathons. <laughs> <laughs> Next one is decisiveness. Study your alternatives and and take the best possible course of action. Know when not to know when not to step in and make a decision. Mm, that's an interesting one from a leadership perspective. I got a new book coming out in January 2020, and I talk a lot about not a lot, but there's a couple sections in there where I talk about how to know when to step up and lead. And I got and I went into some pretty good detail, and it's really cool for me to write this stuff because I get to sit there from a detached perspective and think of all these situations that I, I've been in and how I would handle them. But one of them is when, when there's a little bit of a leadership vacuum, when do you step in? And I went into this pretty big explanation of, okay, well, Obviously, if there's a, a leadership vacuum and there's like an emergency situation and you see that vacuum, you step in there immediately. Mm -hmm. But, and this is as I would think about how I would actually do this. If there's a leadership vacuum, but there's no critical emergency, my first instinct isn't just to step right in immediately because I'm gonna let that thing develop a little bit. I'm gonna see if somebody else I'm ho actually hoping one of my subordinates steps into that leadership vacuum. Mm -hmm. And then I get to s stay detached and I get to watch what the decisions they're making and see what direction, it's all good. And then I talked about what happens if two people step into that leadership vacuum at the same time? What do you do? Oh, what if I step into the leadership vacuum and so does Echo Charles? At the same time we step into that leadership vacuum, what do I do? Can you guess what I do, Echo Charles? Let me lead. Yes, I immediately go, you know, if you and I both say, I say go left, you say go right, right at that moment. I say go left, you say go right. I go, hey, all right, Echo, we're going with your plan. I'm immediately gonna do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, considering that there's no major catastrophic incident, if 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 somebody steps up and takes leadership, I'm, I'm happy to follow, especially if it's my subordinate. Because now as soon as Echo's now gonna take that problem and he's gonna run with it, I can look around and see what else, uh, see what else is going on, look at the bigger picture. So yeah, it's interesting when you look at these leadership vacuums and how you actually handle them. The other thing I talked about is this. This is getting detailed, but if we're in a situation, let's say we're in a platoon, and, and there's a leadership vacuum, and I immediately try and jump into the leadership vacuum as soon as I see it, guess what? Not everyone else saw that vacuum, not everyone else felt it, and there's, peep, there's gonna be some resistance to you changing course right now. Mm -hmm. If I let that situation develop for eight more seconds, six more seconds, 20 more seconds, whatever, whatever it is, 
where all of a sudden people go, wait a second, there's a leadership vacuum. Meanwhile, I'm sitting detached and I'm going, as soon as I, as soon as the moment's right, I'm making a call. And now everyone is waiting for the call. They're waiting to be led. And by the way, the decision that I'm about to make, I've already assessed that it's a good call. Mm -hmm. So there's all these little things to think about when it comes to being decisive. And another thing I say is, be as make your decisions as, as as late as possible, which is a little bit weird, right? It sounds counterintuitive. No, you just make a call immediately. No, actually, I'll make a, this is what I say. I will make the smallest decision I need to make heading in the right direction of what I think the broader decision that needs to be made is. So I won't just immediately say, flank left. No, the first thing I'm gonna say is, okay, get online, put some machine gunners over to the left. We think we're moving that way, but we're not going there yet. Mm -hmm. So this idea of being decisive has got a lot of little nuance to it that you need to think about. Next one, tact. Talk with your Marines, not at them. That's a good idea with your constituents, <laughs> right? Treat others as you would like to be treated. Be steadfast during crisis. Stay calm and steer your command in stormy weather. When reacting to bad news, know that initial reports are nearly always wrong, and then they throw this out. Listen first. Mm-hmm. And I had, I, I think I read a different one because I have some quotes down here. But oh, yeah, I they, they, there's all kinds of, the Marines have yeah. done all kinds of uh, different, and, and not just not just official Marines, but just people, yeah. human beings. Well, the one that I read had a picture of Chesty Puller on it, so yes. I think that's probably the most official. Solid. <laughs> <laughs> but the one of the quotes for tact that I uh, liked from, from the one that I read is, uh, this deference must be extended under all conditions regardless of true feelings. Yes. So I could hate, I could sit totally. across a table and hate, physically hate another legislator, yep. hate everything they stand for, hate their soul. But I'm going to sit there, I'm going to listen to them and say, yep. oh, okay, that's yep. a good That's a good point. Yep. I'm not going to go on Twitter. Yeah. You, and you actually are listening to them. Yeah, and I will, yeah. And actually it's not listen. even just playing the game like, okay, I'll just got to do this. No, it's like I'm actually listening to what yeah. you're saying. I, I actually want to prove myself wrong. Yeah. Ultimately, I, do, I want to be wrong. I want to, I want you to be right. Because how much how much easier is my life if you and I want to get a project done? You have a way of doing it, and I have a way of doing it. How much easier and better is it for me if your way is works better than mine? Yeah, it makes my whole life easier. I go, okay, cool. I get you got my support one hundred percent. You, I know you're voting for you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and as long as it's a good plan, guess what? I get to vote for you too, and I'm happy. Yeah. As opposed to me having to argue and try and pry your vote from you to meet to do the project the way I said, yeah. that's already I already wasted hours, if not days. If if you come up with a decent enough plan, bro, I'm on board. Yeah, and then even at the end, you can you honestly consider what they said, and then your assessment is this person's that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. You don't say that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. It's never going to work. You say, okay. All right. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that might not be yeah. how I would go with it. Well, what, what can you consider this? Yeah. And you don't. You don't just like you act tactfully. Like, yes. Just tact. Wise tact. Initiative. Take action, even in the absence of orders from a superior. Be a self-starter. Plan ahead and have three hip pocket plans for contingencies. Always look to improve. Learn from your mistakes. Initiative. Mm -hmm. Endurance. I actually was laughing when I read, read about endurance. <laughs> My specialty. Right, yeah. <laughs> I think we'll be okay with endurance. Maintain mental and physical stamina. Know when to recharge. Most people who quit do not give up at the bottom of the mountain. They, they stop halfway up it. So endurance, as I said, I don't think we need to even, I think you will, I think you will be the premier endurance person in Congress, period. I'll become quite good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Bearing set the example by maintaining high standards in appearance and personal conduct. Avoid the use of profanity. How do you like that, Echo Charles? Oh, I'm fine with it. <laughs> at the end of the day, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Be professional. Develop gentlemen and ladies and future citizens. Have you heard there's been some uh, some pretty high profile politicians that have dropped some language it gets like immediate press yeah especially if you drop the f-bomb mm -hmm. if you, you drop the f-bomb on national television you're gonna get some coverage <laughs> yeah. it may not be good may not be bad i don't know you Could tell be me good. yeah i i think one of this um general mattis recently is a great i mean obviously he's a great example for all of these yes but especially lately for this because he came out with his book and he's constantly being 
you know, picked at by people that are doing interviews, like say something about yeah. Trump, say something about Trump. And he's come out so many times saying, I'm not going to comment about a sitting president. And they just keep asking again. They mm. ask him in a different way. They ask him in a different way. And he's just, he maintains his bearing. Yeah, he, he, he does indeed. Unselfishness, care for your Marines above yourself, boom. Once again, that goes back to your constituents. Yeah. Taking care of your constituents, not, and you just said, you know, it's not about your political career. Mm -hmm. Take every action to provide for the welfare of your Marines. They always come first. Courage. Take measure, risk, and combat in peace. Act calmly and firmly in stressful situations. Stand up for what is right, regardless of what others think. Accept personal responsibility for your orders and for your mistakes. I think they should actually call that something else, like extreme ownership. <laughs> I have one written down, even in the face of popular disfavor mm -hmm. for what you're doing. So you have to do it even when, if you know that it's, if you believe that it's the right thing to do, no matter how many people are telling you it's the wrong thing, you have to, you have to have the courage yep. to stand out from the group and put yourself out there. And what makes that work, what makes that not an extreme is the fact that has to be balanced with the humility to listen to other people, mm -hmm. right? Because... If I'm just saying, well, you know, I, this is what I believe and I'm sticking with it, but I'm not listening to anyone else, that's a problem. Yeah. If I'm listening to people, but I'm coming up with my judgment and my judgment is the same and I'm listening to more people and people are telling me, no, that's, you shouldn't do it that way. It's going to lose your next election, but you believe it's the right thing to do, you do it. That's courage. Mm -hmm. Correct Marines when required. That's, that's a good one. Because you would think... You would think that that's so easy in the military, you know. Oh, you somebody steps out of line, you you just straighten them out. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because I in the SEAL teams, I know that's hard. It's interesting that the Marine Corps finds that hard as well, because the Marine Corps more rank sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. The SEAL teams is not rank sensitive. It's basically a, a open, you know. It's almost completely, and not not completely open, but it's definitely more open than Marine Corps. Trust me. But you would think that in the Marine Corps, hey, if Lance Corporal's doing something stupid, you're just going to straighten him out immediately. And that's true to some extent. But yeah. when you get to, hey, you you know, you got somebody, maybe that's your peer mm -hmm. that's doing something wrong. Are you going to say something? And it becomes a lot more challenging. Allow subordinates to make decisions. Yeah, that takes courage as well. Knowledge works. Work towards technical, tactical, administrative excellence. Read, study, think, write, and teach. Man, think about that. Read, study, r think, write, and teach. Those things are so underrated. Read, study, think, write, and teach. And actually, I think think should go forth. No, it should go last. Mm -hmm. Because all those other things allow you to think. Those are the things that make you think. If you want, if you read something, you have to think about it. If you study something, you think about it. If, when you write out your thoughts or even talk about your thoughts, that's gonna that's gonna make you think, and it's gonna make you hone those thoughts. And teaching them absolutely will do that. You learn that in jujitsu. The more you teach those moves, the better you get at them. Loyalty. Display faithfulness to your country, the core, to your unit, to your seniors, to your subordinates, and to your peers. Defend your Marines against unfair treatment. Display enthusiasm in carrying out an order, even if you may privately disagree. Now, here's where I gotta, you know, we gotta talk about that one a little bit. <laughs> because if I privately disagree and it's relatively minor, cool, we're gonna carry it out. Mm. The more, all I'm saying is that you reach to a point, you, you can reach a point where if you're telling me to do something that makes no sense whatsoever and it's gonna get people killed, or it's immoral, illegal, or unethical, I'm not gonna carry it out. Yeah. And there's a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole just gray area around that one. Because if sometimes if you don't carry it out, you're gonna get fired, and now you don't have any influence anymore, which is not, which is possibly not a good outcome. Yeah. So. Um, enthusiasm, 
I don't think I don't think this is another one. I think you just win that category. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wrote this one down as I wrote a, what my one note underneath it was belief based on what I read. It's just you have to believe that what you're doing is possible. Even if you think it maybe there's not a great likelihood. Like I believed that when I was going through a danger area looking for IEDs that I would get to the other side, uh, you know, uninjured. And I had to have that belief in order to be able to do it. I had to believe that there was at least a small chance that I could run 31 back-to-back -back marathons. If I didn't believe it at all, I would have ran one and then just been like, oh, I quit. So, and then, in, you know, in Congress, you have to believe that you can make a difference. You have to believe that you can, you know, convince this other person or learn something from that other person uh, that will convince you. You have to actually believe that. And so that's kind of how I interpreted the enthusiasm one. Yeah, and like I said, I, th I think you're, I think I think endurance and enthusiasm, I think anyone would have a hard time <laughs> sort of stepping up to the plate with you in those respects. And then that, that wraps up, you know, these leadership traits from the Marine Corps. And, you know, it's probably a pretty good place to wrap up what we're, you know, this, this podcast today, except for one more thing. And this, that's, we talked a lot about what you're doing right now. Um, people are going to want to support you. Mm-hmm because they listen to the podcast, they're patriots, they wanna have reasonable human beings running the government, not crazy people. So what's the best way to, for everyone to support what you're doing, to get you the, the, the funds that you need, the support that you need? How do we do that? Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of different ways. You kinda of were in a difficult period you know, in our country, and we have what we were talking about with uh, the poison is slowly making its way into the government and feeding out into the society, and it's kind of breaking apart, you know, the glue that holds us together. And so we do need to make sure that, you know, a lot of people are going to, I know that a lot of a lot of the people that listen to this podcast, I'm not going to directly represent them in Virginia 10, which is, you know, Northern Virginia. Um, but we have... You know, everybody knows that the, the decisions that are made in the federal government, they, ref, they affect everybody in some way. So I do think that we all have a responsibility to make sure that the correct people get elected in every office and in every location. Uh, and I truly believe that I can be, I have the, the JJ did tie buckle <laughs> <laughs> attributes. <laughs> To be a person that can go to Congress and, and have a positive effect on it. I'm not going to do it all by myself. I'm not going to go in there and be the one person that saves the world or anything. Uh, but I, I do think that I can start taking it back in that, that other direction. You know, get with Dan Crenshaw, get with Brian Mass, and form these, uh, you know, these coalitions that we can start having a positive effect on, on the way things are going in Congress. Um, so there's a couple different ways that people can help. They can, you know, there's volunteering. If you do live in my district, uh, you can, you can volunteer and you can, we will need people to go out and knock on doors and pass out stuff and make phone calls and that kind of thing. Eventually, uh, you can just tell people, spread the word about, you know, who I am and that I'm running. But, um, I think the, the way that people can have the greatest impact is what we were talking about before. And, and it is the fundraising, um, you know, if I could, I hate asking for money. And if I could fund this whole thing myself, if I had millions of dollars, then I would. But, you know, I'm, I'm from humble means. I don't, I simply don't have, you know, I don't have the money and you're, to do you're, this all myself. Your wife's running the farm right now, right? Yeah, Pam's running the farm. And so, you are, know, we're, Are you guys selling, are you guys selling food? Or are you guys producing yeah, and selling food? Yeah, she goes down to the farmer's market uh, every Saturday and she sells vegetables and she'll be selling eggs soon. Um, so, yeah, you know, how many, we're, how many chickens you got? We got uh, 40. Damn. Yeah, man. We just started getting. They just started laying eggs, so we're we're starting to get like seven, eight eggs now. I only eat five every day, so I can't keep up with them. But they're uh, we're gonna start selling eggs, and then so yeah, the farm is really taken off for Pam, and she's you know obviously she's incredibly supportive of what I'm doing, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't be doing it without her support. Uh, yeah, so we're we're you know we're a humble family, and you know I simply don't have the money, and we are talking. My, you know, the, the current representative, she's raised, 
over a million dollars already just this year because she has those apparatuses in place and she's the incumbent. So she gets yep. a lot of support. Um, so we are talking about that kind of dollar sign where it, it costs millions of dollars to buy the advertising on the TV, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, and all these different places, buy the road signs, buy the flyers, you know, buy cards, all these things. It takes millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, if everybody that listens to this podcast, if you, I know a lot of people write in questions saying, when is jo- when are Jocko and Leif going to start running for office? <laughs> you know, everybody asks that. And hey, listen, the hard fact is Jocko's not running for office. He's leading in a different way, in a just as important way, you know, leading in, in society and in business too. And so he's not running for office and Leif isn't running for office either. But so this is your opportunity here. You've heard what I think. Uh, I've been on the podcast three times. I've read the books. I am on board with the extreme ownership mentality and the attitude. So this is an opportunity for people that want to see somebody that has bought into this in Congress. This is your opportunity to help make that happen. And so if you want to donate, you go to robjonesforcongress.com slash donate. And even if it's a dollar, Ten dollars, whatever. I know. You, do you still get around a million uh, downloads uh, per podcast, something like that? Something like that. Yeah. So let's say a million people donate a dollar. That's a million bucks. That is huge. Uh, that puts me way, way, way far ahead in the game. Big in the time. game, yeah. And so that's the best way. And you know, do it now. Uh, as you're listening to this, just get on your phone and do it right now. It's 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 pretty quick. Uh, don't make me like be like my my friend Frank, <laughs> and after <laughs> I have to chase Frank. him up three times, Frank. You know, don't be Frank, and do it now. And if you really can't do it now, set you know send yourself of a notification so that you remember, or call your wife, send her a voicemail, and say, hey, remind me to donate when I get home. So d- you know, take ownership of that as well. And so this is your opportunity. So. That's the that's the best way, and that's going to the way that people can help the most. Something I noticed yesterday that you have so you had your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, and your YouTube, mm-hmm. and your old one used to be called Rob Rob Jones Journey. Yeah, right. And yeah. now that is that gone? No, that's still there. Um, but now you have Rob Jones for Congress, and on Facebook you have yeah. at Rob Jones v- VA on Twitter and Rob Jones for Congress on the gram, the gram as Echo yeah. Charles calls it. So the reason that <laughs> I, uh, I'm trying to keep Rob Jones journey and the political stuff separate. Cause I know that people that follow me on Rob Jones journey don't necessarily want to see political stuff all the time. So I'm trying to keep those two things separate. So that's why I have the different handles for, you know, for this project mm-hmm. and yeah, interesting. Love to have followers that's an on interesting there. call. I don't agree with it. Yeah, it definitely, you know, it'd be it'd be a bonus to have the 8,000, you know, Instagram followers that I have all getting my, you know, political stuff, but I yeah. kind of do, I kind of want to make sure that I maintain that that separation. Yeah, so that's another thing, is just follow Rob Jones. Yeah, follow me. On all these things. S- smash the follow button. <laughs> sure. Awesome, man. Well, that's that's like... That's what we got to do. We got to give you some support and get you the funds that you need to make this happen. Yes. And yeah, like I said, I hate asking for money, but it's the the, the unfortunate part. uh, It's the way the system works right now. It's the way you play the the game. It's the way you play the game. And we play to win. All right. Echo. Yes. Um, Rob, we got Rob here. Obviously, he's. You know, on the path, big time, on multiple ways. Sure. Is there anything that we need to do to kind of get on the path over here on our side? Yes. Can I bring up a few more things? Oh, I, yeah, I yeah. had a, like just a couple funny things at the end. Now yeah, that we're doing absolutely. the porch, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're in support mode. <laughs> yes. Okay. My first thing. This is directed directly at uh, Echo Charles. Sure. You know how you guys were talking? You were doing the uh, the the Marine Corps. You know, grading system for everybody. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And one, what was the podcast the top number one seventy four? Eminently yeah, qualified. Eminently qualified. And below that, what was the one below that? I don't. I don't know. It doesn't yeah. matter to like, me. It's a loser. Well, yeah. That's 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 cool. yeah. Anyway, I, I th- I'm sure a lot of people have this problem where I'll be listening to the podcast, and you guys will be talking about something, and I want to 
cut into the podcast. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, here's something funny that I could say. So I'm sure a lot of people have that problem. And the vast majority of the time, I'm listening to the podcast when I'm working out or driving in the car or something, so I can't write it down. But this one stuck in my mind. And so it was when Echo Charles, he was talking about it, he said the uh, expertly qualified Mario player. Mm-hmm. Is the is the the man the person that can go through the entire Super Mario game with one guy? Mm-hmm. And I without wanted to warping, bring up, by the way, without warping. Yes. And I just wanted to bring up that the eminently qualified Super Mario Brothers player mm-hmm. would be the people that can do the whole game one guy in less than four minutes, which mm-hmm. is the world record. Yeah, so hey, that's a good thought. But there's, when look, you go, look what you did, when you, Rob when Jones, you go into bro. these, don't so. give Rob any money. Forget it. He's yeah. out. He's triggered. He triggered thing, Echo Charles. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna disagree. I'll agree, but with additional stuff. So I wouldn't say that that would be the standard because you can go. Okay, I can go for time for sure, or I could go for points and get all the coins. Uh-huh. See what I'm saying? Then you could go. I can go for time and coins. Or time and points. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, because if you just go for coins, you're not killing every, everybody if you're going for time and coins. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But if you're going for time and points, you're going for coins, killing everybody as fast as you can. So, yeah. I think that might be the Well, that's the a very top. good point. You see what I'm saying? And maybe we'll let the, uh, let the listeners decide. And the thing is, I know that because I've tried that for the time. And I remember, yeah. Oh, to man, break I'm the doing, record? I'm doing, no, I didn't do, I did not break the record, but I do remember, hey, I didn't kill anybody. I skipped so many coins, which I usually get because I care about how many mana I have. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? Get 100 coins, get an extra man. Okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't really, I don't know how this ties in 100%, but it does tie in some percent. So when we would be, when I first got in the teams, we would do like <laughs> shooting competitions. Yeah. And, you know, you'd have to run to this spot, shoot here, shoot these number of targets, run to a different spot, throw the, put on a rucksack, drag it, whatever. You do this stuff, and then you shoot more targets. And if you miss the target, it was like a certain deduction, right? Yeah. And there would be somebody that would just go, you know what? They would figure it out in their head that the shooting didn't really, if the person didn't set up the course correctly, I could just run through this thing, just yes. dump rounds and win. That is 100%. And then, yeah. and then everyone would look at that guy that did that mm-hmm. and just think loser, right. right? To just not eat, to just, hey, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna win the technicality of this game, yeah. but without, without really truly encompassing the spirit or embracing the spirit, the spirit. of the game. Yeah, that so that true. would almost be like, if you did that, you were gonna get um, shunned yeah. from the group. Yeah, I can dig so, it. I mean, Super Mario Brothers doesn't have that spirit of like killing ev- everything. You do yeah. it kind of because you have to, or you know, it helps you, or whatever. So I get the time thing. And four minutes, I don't think you could do all thirty-two levels in four minutes. No, that they would use be warps. And they use glitches in the game. Uh, okay, yeah, so gl- that's even more defeating the the spirit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I okay. guess we're all we're kind of on the level then, right? Yeah, we are fully. Yeah. And so I guess, and I kind of get though too. Like, okay, you're just going to run through the course, throw rounds down range, and you don't care, but you're going to win, right? Because yeah. you could you save could the look princess. At it. Yeah, yeah, save the princess. You, you could, you look, at, you yeah, could look at it and say, you know what? Hey, I won. Yeah. Whatever. Save the princess. Yeah. But then we get back to what we were talking about earlier. Are you really going to throw your morals out the window just to get the W? <laughs> To get the world record. My, rec- my recommendation is no, don't do that. No, you have a moral my recommendation obligation. Is okay. you, you, you play the game correctly. Yeah. That's my recommendation. Right. Well, okay. So, all right, that's point cross number that one. one. Off. Point that point number one. Okay, the next one is a story. And I found it to be interesting, but stop me if you've already heard it. And there's a story about uh, an African American boy um, when Washington was crossing the Delaware. So he was coming up to cross the Delaware on Christmas Day, and there were the, an African American man and an African American son, and he the the man wanted to join the army to help uh, General Washington, and the boy wanted to fight as well, but he was too young. He was about eleven. And General Washington said, "You're uh, you're too young, but what you can do for us is you can stay back here on this side of the river, and you can mine the horses, and you can hold this. La- you can make sure that this lantern stays alight to." To be it so that we know where we can go, they'll guide us back after the after we win the battle. And that night they they went and they they won the battle and it was a freezing cold night, 
And that little boy, they came back. He had frozen to death, but the lantern was still lit. And that little boy's name, Jocko. Oh, so that's where the little... Well, you know, I don't know. I I had not heard that before. You know, have you ever seen the little jockey Yeah, that's where it comes from. That's, yeah. I know that that guy is called Jocko. That's the legend that came with And he is a little African-American looking little jockey dude. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Now, apparently General Washington... And this is all, you know, legend or whatever. I don't know if it actually happened, but... I know, because this sounds like there could be some urban legend yeah. to this whole thing, So, right? apparently... We, we don't know if this is true. Apparently, we General Washington, uh, he had a memor- memorial statue built, and that's what the little jockey statue is. And then those statues were supposedly used in the Underground Railroad to tell ah. people where they were safe. But Okay, so that's that one. Okay. And my last one, it's kind of serious, because... I actually have beef. Jocko and I have beef. There you go. I know. Stand in uh, line on that So here's one. what happened. We need to we'll squash it. Here's what happened. Uh, moved into a nice little town called Middleburg. Or actually, I was having a house built in Middleburg, and earlier this year was finally finished. And while this house was being built, I was living in Vienna, Virginia, and then Leesburg, Virginia, which are all kind of around Middleburg, Virginia. And after I went on the podcast second time, I was contacted by a guy that I know and then you know, and I think Echo Charles knows him. Uh, his name is um, uh, Dave Burke. Good deal, Dave. <laughs> I was contacted by this gentleman. Mm-hmm. And he said, let's meet up sometime. So I said, okay, where do you live? He said, I live in Aldi, Aldi, Virginia. And I went on there. I was like, oh, that's like five miles from where I live where I'm going to be living in Middleburg. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, man, all right, I'm going to have a friend. Got a neighbor. Out in Middleburg. Built-in neighbor. I have a built-in neighbor. And then we build the house. I'm about to move in. And I see a Facebook post by this Dave Burke. Mm. It says, the, the Burks are moving. <laughs> I go, you guys are moving? Right when I'm moving in? Mm. And Dave says, yeah, well, you know, Jocko had this big opportunity for me out here in San Diego. So the beef is that Jocko stole my friend. Dang, friend and neighbor stolen. Well, if it makes you feel any better, which it probably won't, when he did announce to us, or to me anyway, that he was coming to California, yeah, I was fired up too. Like how you weren't fired up, I was yeah, inversely were, fired yeah. up. You know? Opposites. And then he moves out here and moves up to Carlsbad. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, mm, you know, another one of those deals, man. So same boat. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Last night I was here. And we, originally, me and Dave were going to meet up at Phil's. Yeah, yeah. And there was a possibility. There was a possibility that you were going to come. Yeah, because Phil's, as we know, yeah. is 200 meters from Victory MMA and Fitness. Exactly. It is It is possibly my favorite um Oh, it's definitely my favorite barbecue now that I oh, mentioned yeah. it. Oh, I'm not, not even going to play around. Oh, damn. You know, oh, and we can God. get Leif going, well, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Whataburger. No, no, Leif's got the salt lick. Oh, oh. He's got another, he's got a couple. Leif's got a couple. But, you know, for him, being from Texas, yeah, yeah, Texas. anything, like to even consider the fact that a barbecue outside of Texas could be your number one. You, you, that is that is blasphemy yeah, yeah. for life. One hundred percent blasphemy. Mm-hmm. So yes, Phil's barbecue. And I, I'll tell you what, Tim Kennedy came up, and he lives in Texas. Mm-hmm. And I took him to Phil's, and I said, "Hey, bro, so just stand by." Mm-hmm. And he had cut weight for like a, a photo shoot oh, yeah. or something, and so he was all starving. And I took him over there. And um, yeah, there's no denying it. <laughs> so when you you said to me, "Hey, I'm gonna go out for dinner with Dave Burke. Can you go?" And I was like, "It's you know depends, you know." Possible. But I, I said possible. Yeah. And I actually knew that it was pr- probably not possible. But then I thought, well, if they're going to Phil's, and I get done training, and I can go over there and get get it done in f- 35 to 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. I, I was thinking maybe I'll just yeah. go for it. You make time for fills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it wouldn't it, it, the net loss because it's going to take me. It's going to take me, you know, seventeen minutes to eat, anyways, right? Yeah. Sure. So what, the net loss is like probably what, what around fifteen minutes yeah. total. And we so, could have ordered for you, so yep, that was ready. I could have rolled right in there. there. It would have been good to go. Eight, yeah. Like that would have been a game changer. Yeah. because so, now we're talking like a twelve-minute scenario. Yeah. So I get in, 
and Dave Burke calls me and he says, oh, hey, you know, the the wife and kids, Whitney and the kids, they really want to see you too. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fair. So Bring I'll, them to Phil's, yeah. dude. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, why don't you come over to our house? Yeah. I go, okay, yeah, that, that, that'll work. I, he said he was moving to San Diego. Yeah, he didn't yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, it'll probably just be a couple minutes, a few minutes away. Yeah. No. I was like, okay, maybe Jocko can still come to that. We'll still have a good time. Mm-hmm. And he's like, all right, cool. So uh, maybe I you can jump in an Uber. Time. And he said, come on. And I look in the address that he gives me, and it's 45 minutes away. Yeah. And I'm like, can you still come? And Jocko's like, nope. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, where are you going for dinner? I'm praying that it's going to say Phil's BBQ. Phil's BBQ. <laughs> But it says, or, uh, Dave was ni- nice enough to invite us over to his house. I'm like, cool. Nope. <laughs> Have a good but dinner. That did, being you, said, did you Uber up there? Yeah, I Ubered up there. And then Ubered home? Mm-hmm. Dang. Yeah. Um, You're going to need a whole new slew of donations just to cover the Uber costs. <laughs> well, <laughs> you have no, to sell some <laughs> eggs. Well, no, you can't. You can't. You can't use that. <laughs> yeah, you can't use those ones. You're going to have to. Uh, I got to do another to, speaking engagement or something. Yeah, to Pam's going to have to sell some eggs. Yeah, exactly. But. To be fair, the the evening was very pleasant, and obviously Dave's family is great, and his wife made some great baked ziti that we thoroughly enjoyed. So it was a, a very fun evening, well, but yeah. he did kind of trick me. Here's the crazy thing. So Dave, <laughs> Dave's all fired up, you know, and I'm fired up because Dave's like one of the best people ever, and he's moving out to San Diego, you know, and it's I'm super stoked. And then the Carl's bad word comes in, so we're <laughs> a little bit, you know, we're not quite, you know. But here's the funny thing. Uh, you know how many times I've seen Dave since he moved out here? Like three times. Mm-hmm. I'm not even kidding because yeah. he's on the road all the time working. I'm on the road all the time working. So it's cool that we've seen each other three times. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know. It's not that cool. Hopefully that it'll part. improve over time. Yeah, yeah. So those are pretty good beefs. Any other other beefs yeah. with yeah, me? The beef yeah. is squashed. You, you want to hear something weird? Okay. Like when you tell me you have beef with me. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. Like You thought he was serious? No, 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 no. But like. I was like, okay. Like, I mean, I got into a yeah, kind he, of a He mode. reached for the pocket knife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, He reached okay, for the knife. He opened it up. <laughs> okay. I see Luckily, a, I have this I see uh, how the bigger one over here. Mm. Did you see Mazdaval after his fight? And someone's like, you know, you have beef with this guy? And he goes, he goes, no, no, I don't have beef. If I had beef with him, I'd be waiting for him outside of his house. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was legit. Mazdaval's fight, Nate Diaz. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. It's going to be good. But I thought that was legit when he says... No, I don't have beef. No, if we had beef, I would be waiting outside of his house. Right. That's what would be happening. Mm-hmm. So you and I don't have beef. No. We well, that was just a funny thing. That was because when you said thing. we had beef, I was like, oh, we're getting in a knife fight. Chocolate <laughs> triggered. <laughs> yeah, you saw. I, I witnessed it. Yeah. That's all it. Right. That's all my comments. Now we can get those to are this those support. are good. Those are good beefs. Mm-hmm. Those are good good comments. We're gonna do some research about Jocko the plaster lantern holder. Mm-hmm. I. Th- I'm not sure. What do you think? You think it's urban legend or real? Do you think there was a little black kid holding a lantern for George Washington that froze to death? Yes or no? Fact or fiction? Yes. Oh, you're going with it. Wow. Yeah. But well, put it this way: it it might not be exactly that, but I think it's like something. Put it that way. it's not nothing. Put it that way: it's not just ooh, someone made up. Yeah. That's what I think. Here's the thing: I don't know. Yeah. That's the first you know time I heard that story. Really by the way, horrible. But I have actually, I have actually, I actually know this, and I cannot remember. Like I can't remember it's true or not because at some oh, point, you know if it's real or not. No, no, like I, at some point, I, I, somebody told me that these little statues were called Jocko, and I was like, oh, I wonder why that is, and I figured out where it came from, but I can't remember what the story is. So it could be true, it could be not be true. I don't know yet. Well, that's yeah. just what I heard. We're going to research it. Yeah, and I yeah. would. So I wouldn't be surprised. Most likely case scenario in my head right now is that. That story overall is true. Maybe some details here and there. Maybe, maybe not true. Yeah. You know, and it all sort of ties in. Yes. So we'll go with it in that regard. Going yes. yes. Well, that was just the, one of the vaguest yeses yeah, I've ever is. heard. Well, put it this way. It's, yes. not just, it's not just like, oh, here's a statue that means something else, you okay. know, some other thing. But, hmm, this will sound good if we make up this story, yeah. you know, based on really like some thinly veiled like element that Here's translates. what concerns me. I think if it was that story that I had read when I researched it in the past, it seems like that would make the connection in my neurons and I'd be like, oh yeah, that's true. Not quite there. You're not feeling that? Not feeling that full. I I remember, but I, I, you know, you're, you're subject to your 
power of your memory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a while ago that I researched that. Yeah, man. I but anyways. It. Okay. Cool. So we got beefs settled. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we got Dave Burke close. Still, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. we're, you know, we're working through it. <laughs> Dave Burke, you know, maybe when he's, yeah, because less. you well, know how lame I am yeah. when uh, you, yeah. when, yeah, when you call me and you're like, Hey, you know, the fights are on. You want to come watch the fights and you live 17 minutes from me. I'm like, well, I'll probably just <laughs> not watch it with you. <laughs> yeah. So, it's like a big thing. Right? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. When you're thinking 45. Yeah. Some traffic. Minute yeah. halfway to LA. Let's face it. Time wise, <laughs> it's halfway to LA. So let's <laughs> might as well just be. That's crazy. Oh yeah, you're not that's, watching. That's a really harsh way if to look at it. If you want to go there during the week, really harsh way to look at it. To sir. say, oh, you only live halfway Half- to LA. Yeah, man. It's I, I agree. I agree. There was an old Saturday Night Live skit uh-huh. that was just Californian people talking, and all they would talk about was the traffic. <laughs> Like oh you know, oh morning how was the four hundred five this morning oh my god it was a nightmare and then the you know uh, they just talk, that was what yeah, the big yeah. joke was you were on the one hundred one right? yeah yeah yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Was I, I was the one hundred one one got jammed up right around the yeah, you know yeah. exit forty eight oh I'm glad I got you know like that yeah, yeah. and here yeah, you are true. halfway to L A. <laughs> You can't even go within day. fifty miles of L A. Yeah, uh, yeah. hey, all right the struggle's real. But hey, like like you, like we all understand now. We're powering through it. Not much talk about jujitsu. This podcast, in its direct form, in its indirect form, it was everywhere. Mm-hmm. The spirit of jujitsu is everywhere. <laughs> yes. Like was that the last time that we you came here that we trained? First time. That was the first time. Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, it's good. I ha- I actually have jujitsu legs, legs now. made. So oh, now dang. that I'm in the, my new schedule, I've, t- I've gone and taken a couple Filipino Kali lessons because mm-hmm. I was taking those when I was living in Salt Lake City. Yeah. So now I'm making the transition to finding, you know, the, the scheduling time where I can go and find a good place to go and start using my jujitsu legs. I like it. Mm-hmm. Put like hooks on those jujitsu legs. Yeah. yeah like, like a butterfly hook. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's what I was thinking. Fully. So being on the path. Supporting mm-hmm. others and ourselves. We're doing jujitsu. Highly recommended. Required? We'll say required already. Mm, let's go with it. Yeah. I'm going with it. Requ- at some point, required. Anyway, you're going to need a gi. What kind of gear are we going to get? We're going to get an origin gi made in America. 100% in America. The cotton that's grown to make the fibers, to make the material, to make the gi. Mm-hmm. To make all, the weave to make the gi. Because there's different weaves. 100%. Made in America. No compromise. No compromise. You know how much compromise? None. Zero. Yeah, zero compromise. Hundred percent no compromise. Boom. Uh originmain.com. That's where you can get your gi. Various levels of gis. I don't even know if they're levels, we'll just say options. Because yeah. there's not like one's not necessarily better. They're just that's options. all a matter of opinion. It's like when you, you might like you might like this Cadillac or you might like that Cadillac. The Cadillac. They're both good cars. Oh yeah. Right? Hundred percent, yes. But you might want one for a certain reason instead of another one. Yep, to fit your uh, lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh, hey, but you cannot only get geese there because unfortunately not everyone does train jiu-jitsu. And unfortunately, geese are not fully accepted as the garment to be worn in all occasions at all times. Yeah, we still have to wear other clothes sometimes. And yeah. one of those clothes that we sometimes wear, most often, is something called jeans. Yes, sir. And Origin makes jeans. American denim. Same deal. Same thing. Same thing. From the time that the atoms <laughs> that form, that grow, right? Uh, the atoms are yeah, American. Yeah, I don't know if atoms grow, but, no, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> but they they form American. growth, right? And they sure. have little American flags on those atoms. <laughs> Because that's what we do. <laughs> actually, you're right. Actually, yep. and and so yes, we're talking about patriotism. Rob's a patriot. Mm-hmm. Rob's serving. Guess what we're doing? What we're doing is trying to bring manufacturing back to America. We we just hired more people. By the way, we got more people up at the factory up in Maine because we're making boots now. Because Americans need boots. They need jeans. So yeah, if you want to support the United States of America. If you want to bring us back to the leaders of manufacturing, go to originmain.com, get jeans, get geese, get rash guards, get t-shirts, 
get joggers if you are a jogger person. If you're that, that is a good, uh, how should I say, very significant, important disclaimer. Yes, because I'm not a jogger person. Yeah, you're no. not allowed to wear no, joggers. I no, looked no. really weird in joggers. Yeah. So yes. don't don't get those if you're me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you're interested in maximum comfort and functionality, to let's be honest, joggers, when you actually jog in them, which I have like twice, you they function well. They don't flap around. I would around. never, ever, ever jog in a pair of pants. Right. Right. Ever. Yeah, just too short. Yeah. Hey. Like no matter what. Yeah. So well, you know, not everyone's like that. So, okay. You know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, also supplements, mm -hmm. right? Talk about support. This is like actual physical, anatomical support. Yeah, mm -hmm. to Joints. your whole it's a big system. deal. The whole deal. Yeah. Building the fibers that support. Building the, the atoms. Yeah, the atoms. <laughs> build the atoms. Building support. the atoms American straight atoms. up. Atoms. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Or but well, in this case, With it can be non-American. Yeah, yeah, sure. That too. But nonetheless, these are um, we establish the fact that these are the most important kind of supplements right here because they keep you in the game mm. like how we said before keep you in the game yeah it's not something you're not what it's like watering the roots rather than watering the leaves you don't water leaves no don't unless water you leaves. do water leaves on it you don't I think right? you water the roots the roots yes yeah. exactly yeah. right so you want those roots to be strong that's what super krill oil joint warfare that's what these things do they mm. water the roots you grow however you also like. we got discipline Yes, sir. Which Dave Burke is a big supporter of. Mm -hmm. He takes discipline. Go capsules. You yeah. know, get his mind right. <laughs> but guess what? You get discipline in the powder. Uh, by the way, Andy Burke has been tripling up his scoops. And I rolled with him last night again. Luckily, that one wasn't on video. <laughs> <laughs> that video actually, the one of you and Andy rolling, yeah. it was like just for like three minutes. What was that like the end of the round or something? It, or if, yeah, it was whatever was left on the round or yeah, something. Yeah, that that was an actually an uncanny, uncannily accurate depiction of rolling with you. It just felt like super <laughs> heavy and not, not spazzy. Yeah, no, yeah, like yeah, just yeah. real heavy and just like heavy. The, we should read the comments. We should do a podcast where we just read comments. I know we've oh, talked yeah. about that, but that had some <laughs> funny comments. Yeah. yeah People just, you know, you talk about political haters, and there were some... <laughs> So oh, really bro. funny. Haters. No, they were hating on me. They were hating on Andy. They were hating on jujitsu. <laughs> I mean, most people were su super cool, but the yeah. funny ones, the ones that would be worth like comically reading, were yeah. ones that you know people that were just talking smack. Yeah. That's how, man. Too. Yeah, that's yeah. how. Martial arts is one of those trigger events. You know, like martial arts, diet, raising kids, religion, yeah. sleep, politics. Apparently, yeah. sleep. Apparently, so, yeah. Like how much do you sleep? You're gonna actually die. Oh yeah, nutrition. Because you don't sleep, sleep enough. <laughs> uh, speaking of discipline, we got new discipline. It's in a can. It's yeah. called Discipline Go. It is what I'm gonna call clean energy, right? Yep. Oh yeah. You know you got that good. energy that's that's not clean. Oh yeah, dirty energy. It's called drinks with a bunch of sugar in them yes, and other chemicals. This drink has not that in it. Yeah, it's like you, it's clean energy, like you can't even call it an energy drink. Let me, let me read you the is. ingredient list. Filtered carbonated water, natural flavor, citric acid, monk fruit. Boom. That's Did you clean. hear that? That's clean. That yeah. is as clean <laughs> as you can make a drink. Clean. And you know why? You know what's revolutionary? What's revolutionary? The way we're able to do that is because we are pasteurizing this, like what they do with milk. We are pasteurizing it. We're heating it to that certain level, killing all the bacteria or whatever that's in there so it can stay on the shelf without putting a bunch of chemicals, which is what everyone else does. So, discipline, go. We got two flavors right now. We got more coming, and they're all good. What's this the one's lemon other, lime. The, the other one's one? Tropic Thunder. Oh, dang, I don't think I had to. And I'll tell you, it's either. called Tropic Thunder. And sometimes, you know, oh, that's a cool name, whatever. It was either that or I had to call it what it is. And you want to know what it is? Yeah, pina colada. That's pina colada. <laughs> but let's face it. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't match. I can't come yeah. out with something called pina colada. No. No, <laughs> not happening. <laughs> so we called it Tropic Thunder. Yeah. So, yeah, Good. you can get that discipline. Go, yeah. cans, f all that stuff from originmain.com. Also, protein. milk, protein. Yes, yeah. dessert in the f or protein in the f form of a dessert and this work kid milk. Protein in the form of a dessert for your kid yeah. and a snack. It's like a sweet snack, we'll say, for yeah. the kids, right? For, yeah, yeah. It's actually an amazing thing. Either and and then, nice. what are you what are you drinking today, uh, Rob Jones? In my my little thing down yeah. there. I got some. Uh, 
chug a white tea. And um, I have never felt more. Men, just my mental faculties are just firing, firing on all cylinders. All cylinders. Yeah. And you're a tea drinker because your wife's from England. Big tea drinker. I'm actually trying to create my own drink. You know how Arnold Palmer? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. You're a fan of the Arnold Palmer. You like to put a little shot of uh, well, lemon let me tell in you your what. iced tea. We have a little flavor coming out for Powdered Discipline and a flavor coming out for Discipline Go in the can. And the name of the flavor is Jocko Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. <laughs> no, and I'll good. tell you what, it is the one that both of them. They are you like you like Arnold Palmer's? Yeah. So if you picture the best Arnold Palmer that you ever had, that's how good these are. I was like when I when I went through whatever eight samples and like no more of this more tea less that more mm-hmm. and finally got when we when I got the good one when I got the final one, I told B Little I'm like hey. St- Go manufacture both these things right now. I want this stuff tomorrow. And he's like, it's going to be six weeks. I'm like, bro, <laughs> send me more samples. More samples. <laughs> All right. So, so, yes. I'm trying to get my own drink made or not made, but kind of make it a thing. Uh-huh. You know how when uh, the first time I was here, we went and we had iced teas and I put a little half and half in there. Little hitter. Yeah. Yeah. So I. I kind of got that from learning how to drink tea from Pam. So uh, she introduced me to the way that English people drink tea. They put milk in there. Put a little milk in there. Yeah. So I came back. I'm American. We like to do the iced tea. Mm-hmm. And I thought I'm thinking outside the box. I'm an outside the box thinker. Oh, sure. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to have an iced tea and bring a little half and half too. Pour that in there. Delicious. Most people think, oh, it's gross. Hmm. But what I'm going to start doing now, I'm going to start saying, I'll have a Rob Jones. Uh, and the waiter will be like, oh, what's that? I'll be like, oh, yeah. well, no, you don't Ice know that. Iced tea with half and Ice half? Iced tea with a little half and half in there. I would have been way more supportive of this <laughs> if you would have said, oh, so I'm going to bring it back a little bit. So I put milk in there, vanilla milk, because let's face it, that's an option. Mm-hmm. That's an option. I have tried that. Uh, vanilla milk I haven't with tried tea? milk. I've tried protein powders like in okay, well, regular yeah, tea. You haven't tried anything. Yeah, that's yet. right. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try. But at, <laughs> now at you this, and I have beef now. <laughs> <laughs> At this juncture, it wouldn't be that wise to do the milk thing yet because half and half is going to be a little bit more widespread at this point. See what I'm saying? Yeah. If he's trying to establish, that's the true. goal is establishing the Rob Jones. Yeah. Like the half and half. I that's have my the own better drink that everybody right knows about. Yeah. So in a way, it's kind of up to you, to us, to bolster the, the availability of, of milk. milk. In a general way. So we way. can make the Mulk Jones. Mulk Jones. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the next level. Yeah, that's the next level one. Hey, that's a good I yeah, support, this, I you, you know the discipline, the Arnold, Pal- the Arnold Palmer flavor, which is called Jocko Palmer? <laughs> it's so good. Bro. <laughs> it's yeah. ridiculous. Arnold, mm-hmm. All right. So that's that. Also, Jocko White Tea, all the Mulk, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Check. OriginMain.com. That's mm. Boom. Get That'd it. Get, you get whatever you need, whatever you like. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. Yep. So, Apparently. online store. Yeah. If you want to represent, you go jockostore.com. This is where you can get your Defcore shirts. Come on, let's face it. When you see someone representing the Defcore, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> it's good, man. But yeah, you can get Discipline Equals Freedom t shirts, hoodies, lightweight and heavyweight hoodies, by the way. Trucker hat or Flex Fit? Rob Jones. What is a Flex Fit? It's the one that fits. And flex. Oh, like the fitted caps? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, no, no. They're, they're fitted, but, yeah. they, they, but they they have a little elasticity little, oh. stretch in there. So, mm. just, you know, they, yeah. Dang. Truckers, bro. Yeah, I'd have to go Thank truckers. You. But Check. not by a wide margin, apparently. Well, you know, there's certain instances where the uh, the flex might be better. Right. If we you're just out, can't think of any. <laughs> if you're working out, if you're yeah. outside, yeah. you're going to be sweating a lot. I don't know. But we're not against flex fit. I like both. Yeah. yeah. But like if I had to choose one that to wear That was a forever. very political answer you just gave there, Mr. <laughs> Congressman. It, 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 it very much was. I had to pick one. Yeah. But here's the wear thing. For the rest of my good. life, I go trucker. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Okay. See, I prefer the flex have. foot. Here's the thing. I don't wear hats at all anymore. why are you participating in this debate, bro? Because when I used to wear hats. What made you stop? I don't know. I think he was like. Did your head get step. hot in the sun? Yes. Then you don't wear a hat. Oh, sorry, I don't. Because I, I should. Because I fashion guess. sense? No, no. Because no. lack of hat. Lack of preparation for the hat. Dude, head hot scenario. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I don't I think about it. I have a hat with me everywhere yeah. I go. Yeah. 
Well, I don't wear it all the time because yeah. I'm not one of those guys. <laughs> what, what guys? The I guys know, who wear hats just all wear the time. a hat all the time. Yeah, I dig it. Um, I don't think about it. If my head isn't hot, I don't think about it for whatever reason. Check. But nonetheless, okay, we got both. That's that's the good news, Rob Jones. We have both. You okay. Flex fit. Yeah. You get a good flex fit. You can fit. make your own decision. Boom. Yes, sir. Yep. You're this correct is, on that one. You are 100% wrong. And I am 100% right. Truckers oh, yeah. hats are better. Gotcha. <laughs> and if you don't like truckers hats, you're evil. Yes, exactly. <laughs> not, yeah, you are not, not an American. Hey, man, I understand. You're a communist. Jockostore.com. Yes. For you communists or otherwise, you know, whatever. No, Patriot, no communists. Com- no communists allowed. No. Yeah, but communists won't represent like that anyway. See what I'm saying? So True. they're just going to, they're going to, what do you call it? They're going to scroll. Yeah. They're not gonna cool. Click. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast which apparently you haven't done yet, according to Echo Charles. You've listened to 100, and 190 that, whatever like, podcasts. And yeah. you didn't subscribe, according to Echo Charles. So he says you should subscribe. Amen. If you want. And he we'll throws it if you want in there. So it's like. So that means you don't, that you don't have Correct. to. Correct. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't have to. It's all optional, really, at the end of the day. Also, Worry Kid Podcast. Subscribe to that mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. My daughter has a question for Uncle Jake. By the way, I told her last night that Uncle Jake recommended strongly that she just call him on FaceTime or whatever since she has the direct line. She felt real good about that. I sent her a video today, by the way. Yeah? Yeah. She sent me a video first. Okay. From Sarah Charles's. Okay, cool. Uh, She's bringing away the warrior kid to school. Yeah. Show and tell. Yes, she is. Oh, nice. She sent me a little video. I'm bringing this book into school. Thank you. Yep. First grade. And then she was telling me a little bit about the book. And then I said, hey, because she said, said, there's even a picture of you on the back. And I informed her that her dad took that picture. Echo Charles. That's really the kind of the meat of that book is that that photograph that you took. That's what mm-hmm. I thought. A lot of people. And I guess that. there's some cool lessons or whatever, but <laughs> yes, you are right. That picture. Is yeah, cool. Warrior Kid Podcast. We, we are in the process of recording a couple right now, which is cool. good. I have a story in my brain for the Uncle Jake story. So we're getting there. So Warrior Kid Podcast, subscribe yeah. to that. And also don't forget about Warrior Kid Soap. We got Aiden up in Central California. Speaking of farming, lives on a farm. I use the soap. It's awesome. It yeah. is. It's, it is very much t- so, yes. Totally legit. So go to irishoaksranch.com. And that way you can stay clean. <laughs> yeah. Also, YouTube channel. We do have a YouTube channel officially. Hey, yeah. Rob Jones has a Rob jo- has a Rob Jones for Congress YouTube channel as well. Mm-hmm. I didn't yeah, we want do. to forget about that because yeah. you're putting some cool videos up there. That's what, another way to see what what's happening. Put, um, or like what kind of videos? So do? far, the only yeah, one we have no is explosions. our announcement video. Echo. No explosions. <laughs> Done. Don't worry. We'll talk well, after this. Well, there is a real life bit. explosion in yeah, the That's video. right. You do have a real <laughs> life. There's <laughs> one explosion. Off. Is that the actual <laughs> explosion that you set off? No, no, no. Oh, no, I was going to say. Well, I mean, we set it up and it was oh, like okay. controlled that. It, it was wasn't the one that I stepped on or anything. Yeah. People didn't really pull their cameras out during... Those yeah. types of situations. It's weird though. That makes there's sense. people that have the, there's people that have yeah. footage of everything. Like some some yeah. guys put uh, cameras yeah. on their rifles. Yeah, or whatever cameras too. on okay. the rifles on their helmets. There's yeah. videos of everything nowadays. I mean, uh, when when we had Ron Schur on here, who who um, they like assaulted this hill, and he, and he he's a Medal of Honor recipient. The whole almost the whole thing is on video. It's on YouTube. Wow. You can watch it. So it's like. Crazy. And you watch it, and as bad as it sounds when you read about it, as bad as the situation sounds when you read about it, you're like, I'm thinking to myself, man, this sounds absolutely horrible. You watch the video and you go, oh my god! I mean, yeah. I was laugh, I was, I was laughing about it with him because yeah. these, these guys get out in the valley. It's not even a valley. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a ravine. No, it's, a, it's a, it's a canyon. Yeah, they get out at the bottom of the canyon and assault up a hill, a freaking giant. <laughs> reinforced castle it's like out of a out of a prius or a, a medieval movie <laughs> and that's what they did and like they didn't make it all the way up because it was an, an impossible task but yeah so there's there is a video that's why when you said oh there's an explosion i remember watching that video yesterday but yeah not the explosion yeah not the the explosion no but what um as far as like videos or whatever like i'm yeah. gonna subscribe i'm gonna smash the like button all that stuff what uh what am i gonna be watching um, yeah, you're going to be watching stuff like that. You're going to, mostly the videos that we're going to be doing is just getting people to know who I am, what I'm about. Gotcha. So there might be some personal stuff on there where I'm going around the district and kind of talking about, oh, you know, when I, this is where I went to elementary school. Uh, this is where I used to go hiking on the Appalachian Trail, you know, stuff like that. So just right getting on. people to know what I'm all about as a person. Right uh, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of that stuff. Cool. If, if you need footage. 
from the podcast, you could take little clips of your statements and stuff. Let Echo know, you know, and they yeah. could, you could uh, what, edit some of those. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we do have our YouTube channel, Jock Podcast YouTube channel. If you're interested in what Rob Jones looks like, if you don't know already, which I think we're going to be do. sorely disappointed if you want to know. <laughs> Man. <laughs> and then there's yeah. psychological warfare. It's a bunch of me in little short recordings about how the decision that you're about to make, which is the wrong decision that you know, and you need a little something to get you to make the right decision, psychological warfare will get it done for you. Just press play on your smartphone device, device yeah. and you will literally make the right decision. Yeah, what that does really. And I know literally is overused, but I'm saying you will for real, literally, literally yeah. make the right decision. It makes sense because it's you talking about them almost it's making the a short term. It's the whole thing that we covered on Machete Season. When the first thing, the re when a revolution happens, they take over the radio stations because they want to get right into the thoughts of the people, yeah. Yeah. right? No, you don't have to read it. You don't have to interpret anything. It's going into your brain. It's yeah. words. Mm -hmm. That's what psychological warfare, it's going right into your brain. Yeah, but your words are saying, hey, right now you're about to make a short term, short -term play. play. Hey, let's just shuffle that. that over to the long term. That's all we're, we're gonna do. We're gonna make that decision, but instead of short term, we're gonna go long term. That's all we're gonna do right now. And then you go, oh, shit. well, that's what we're gonna do. And then you go do it. That's what it does. Yeah. Effectively, by the way. Yeah, yeah, so you could do that. You could put a cure of the dawn. You ever heard a cure of the dawn? A cure of the dawn, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because you could just listen to a cure of the dawn tracks. Sure. Eight minute tracks. Yeah. What's a music in the background? <laughs> But yes, then just me is. talking. Yes. Is that weird? N uh, no. People no, dig it. Yeah, I, I dig it. I dig it. I like music in the back of talking. I like that whole yeah. thing. Well, that's what the good video is, and people love that. It's an awesome yeah, video. That yeah. is true. Good, good music there. A lot of people think it's maybe what gets said, but then yeah. some, most people think it's just the video effects yeah. that make that video cool. That's, yeah. that's what you've told me a lot. Yeah, I'm one of those people for sure. <laughs> but, you know, hey, different <laughs> perspectives. What, all three yeah, you All right, if you want visual... Uh, reminders of staying on the path, go to flipsidecanvas.com. That's Dakota Myers' company, and he's making really cool graphic designs, including two that just got released, which are Way of the Warrior Kid. Well, one's Way of the Warrior Kid, the rules for the Warrior Kid, and then and then also a picture of Mikey yeah. heading out in the forest to face the dragons. Designed by John Bozak himself. Drawn by John Bozak himself. Okay. So check those out, flipsidecanvas.com. Also on it. On it fitness, on it.com slash chocolate. That's where you can get your kettlebells, battle ropes, rings, highly essential rings, which I didn't know before. I know now, 100% no. Rings, uh, maces, steel maces, steel bells, all this stuff. Really good stuff on there. Really good stuff. Mm -hmm. On it.com slash chocolate. Got a bunch of books. Got leadership strategy and tactics field manual. I talked a little bit about it today. You can pre order it right now if you want to get a first edition. If you don't want to get first edition, just wait. Just wait with everything that you do. Go down a path in your life where you're just waiting for everything and nothing ever happens. Do that. Or order now and get the, get the first edition. Some also got Way the Warrior one. Kid 3 where there's a will. That's also live. You can get that one immediately. And there's a Way the Warrior Kid and Mark's Mission. Those are all available. And then Mikey and the Dragons. That's the best kids book for ages under six. Sure. Yes. Maybe even over six sometimes. Yeah, sometimes over six. Because those things you forget about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And and it's kind of obvious, like being like afraid of something. Then you say, then somebody will be like, hey, what are you really afraid of? Like, Dang, I didn't really think about what I'm really afraid. It just feels scary. Yep. Whatever uh, it is. We had a little incident at the Willink household sure. uh, two days ago. Yeah. It was time to go for an ocean swim with my youngest daughter. There was a tide scenario that was making it the only water entry was a little cliff jump. And my daughter, my daughter, was hesitant at the moment of truth. How high? Not high at all. Depends on where the waves were at. Right. And you had to time it well. And there's a lot of, let's say, white water activity in the zone, which yeah. raised the fear level. Yes, in sir. fact, I asked her, what are you afraid of? And she's like, it looks like it's crazy down like there. Rough, yeah. yeah. But we had a little talk, and then I threw her in. <laughs> <laughs> 
I did. I got to admit, you know. Wait, and, but was it like the kind of surprise throw you in, or is no, it like, no, hey, it don't worry, like, you, and you have to make a decision? I, I, I got gave you. her. I gave her time to think about it. And actually, part of the reason that I gave her time to think about it was I wanted. I wanted her to experience the fear for a longer amount of time, right? Not just like, no, we gotta do it right now, let's go. I wanted her to stand there and think about it because that's actually the worst part. Yes. And so then finally, I said, listen, I said, she's like, I really don't want to. It really looks, it looks like it could be really dangerous. It looks like I'm gonna get sucked into those rocks. And I said, you're not gonna get sucked into the rocks. You're gonna be fine. And just so you know, you are going to do this. So we can wait as long as you want, but this is happening. Mm -hmm. And when my kids know me, like when I say that, (laughs) It's not, there's no, yeah. like, there's not, it's going to happen. Yeah. And so I said that to her, and she kind of got the defeated look on her face. Oh, man. Because she knew it was going to happen. Yeah. And the, the, the goes, oh, tears welling up. Oh. A little bit. They didn't oh. come and out, but I could see it. Right. And, and my youngest daughter, she got these big, big blue eyes, and she's real good with that whole play. Oh, right? yeah. That whole play. I, I can oh, yeah, she's good. Yeah. She, my wife, she would break my wife down like a child. I would just snap her morale no right in half. No, my oh, wife stands yeah. zero chance. Yeah. When those, she got those big eyes that it can, it can hold a tear. <laughs> like it can just hold it there, which is even trick. worse, right? Yeah, yes, so sir, the big eye, And so she started doing that with me. Guess what? It didn't, I don't play that. It's, it's just, those tears in the industry, we call those tears falling upon a heart of stone. Yes, that's what was <laughs> happening. Yeah. So she started get work in that angle. I said, don't even, don't work that angle. It's happening. We're going off this cliff. So we get, so finally she's, def- she looks defeated. She knows it's happening. She walks to the edge. And I said, okay. And it was, it's kind of a tight little promontory mm. to try and jump off just a little thing jutting out. It's actually not big enough for two people. Gotcha. Yeah. So I kind of put her a little bit in front of me. And then I said, okay, we're gonna go on three. And I knew I couldn't actually go with her because there's certain rocks down there you gotta watch out for. So then I just kinda, I go, okay, one, two, scooped her up, grabbed her and threw her off. (laughs) 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 And you laughed like that as she was going down. You know the 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 code in her mind. You know, the best thing, and then she hit the water, she started swimming away from the rocks so she could be safe. And then I, I got watched her, and mm. then and then she looked up and she had a big smile on her face because oh, guess good. what? It's fun. Yep, yeah, she, she was. Over. And then we swam, you know, whatever to back all around the point to the to the to the beach. Well, that's so, good though. And I told her, I said, look, that's what that was. That was Mike and the Dragons. That was that was you stood up and faced your fears. Yeah. That was jumping off the bridge for Mark, where the warrior kid. You just did it. That's what it's yeah. about. But in when you look at a big picture, like that's a specific scenario where you knew her like capability mm-hmm. her limitations or whatever. Cause sometimes like you get someone maybe not comfortable in the water or something like this oh, yeah, that's a and you throw them in oh, yeah, and they don't, problem. they're not looking back smiling. Oh, they are no, traumatized no. <laughs> and now they can't go in the water at all anymore. You know? Yeah. I kind of did that with one of my friend's kids. <laughs> No, like the dad is a good friend of mine. He was on uh, deployment. Yeah, you're not invited to my house. Yeah, no, no, he was on By deployment. Check it out. He was on deployment. Okay. And so while he's on deployment, who guess who's responsible for like making sure that the son is kind of like, you know, legit. It's me. And I didn't get to see him that much because I was like working and deploying and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I finally saw him at the beach and I was like, cool, we're going in the water. And he's like, I don't really want to go in there. I was like, oh, but what? <laughs> and I just picked him up and I hucked him out in the surf zone. Uh, he, he wasn't happy. The mom was crying. I don't know. No, she wasn't crying, but, but she definitely was like, you know how you know how sometimes things are unfolding, and you can tell people they're just doing their best just to like detach from it. Yes, she was in that mode. <laughs> She's a good friend of mine, but she was kind of like, look, I know this guy's probably this not is probably anymore. not great. But yeah, but he handled, or was he like, I don't know if I can even hang with Jocko anymore. It was probably not the best. <laughs> it was probably not the best move on my part. I also did that one time with a real little kid where I picked this little kid up and I said, you know, something, it was a boy, right? And I said something like, oh, there he is. And it's really, oh, yeah. And she's like, oh, isn't he cute? I was like, yeah. And he needs to get used to, you know, things like machine gun fire, like really loud. And the kid started crying because this kid was like six months older, maybe even a little bit younger. Six months old, so a baby. <laughs> Got yeah, it. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah, so uh, be careful with that. Well, that they, the, so, how did, so you essentially, and I'm trying to gather like info so I can actually use yeah. in the real world. So you kind of, you're like on the, on the, what do you call it? On the, the borderline of too rough, right? right? Yes. So, no, and I, I'm better now. Yeah. I'm better now. Yeah. Not to just totally go into like one more little situation 
I was surfing with my little daughter, same one, right? And it was, we were done, and there's cliffs you gotta climb up yeah. to get out, well, carrying your board. It's cliffs, it's a trail, it's a whole nine yards. And so what I did was, she's 10 years old. So I, and it can be hard. And there's little parts where you could possibly fall off, right? Yeah. Probably not though. Most likely you're gonna be good if mm-hmm. you think about what you're doing. So I get done and I got my board. So I run up to the top of cliffs carrying my board. I put it down and I turn around so I can go help her carry her board for her. Yeah. And I thought to myself, if this was my son, when my son was that age, there was zero chance of me going down and helping him. Zero. Yeah. You figure it out, kid. <laughs> And so I stood there at the top and I just watched her. And she made it up. And when she got to the top, I said, you know, I was gonna come help you. I said, but if that was your brother, there's no way I would have ever helped him. And I don't, I would rather have you do it for yourself. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to give you special treatment or do you wanna be strong? And she's like, I wanna be strong. And I said, cool, we're good. (laughs) Yes. So there you go. You can have a tendency to Lean, especially when you got your baby kid, right? The youngest kid. Oh yeah. Especially when they can make those tears thing, the oh, big yeah. tears, oh, yeah. the big giant <laughs> tears sitting on the edge of their eyeballs. Effective. But right. that's how you do run that risk, though, of going like touch, you know, sticking one toe over the border. Well, you can definitely and making the, the kid cry. Yes, you can traumatize the kid. You can make yeah. him hate the water. There's a lot of things you can do. So you got to be careful. Okay. You got to lean towards. And actually, the best policy is you lean towards whatever you do with them builds their confidence, doesn't break it. Yeah. That's the that's the line. That's you say, cool. oh, if I throw them in the water, mm-hmm. and they get they get done with it, and like, oh, I actually did it. That builds their confidence. Cool. If you throw them in the water, and now it freaks them out, and you broke their confidence, that's bad. So mm-hmm. the line that you should be going for is everything that you're doing with your kids builds their confidence until they become overconfident, and then we have to start putting them in check. That's when you take them for the pool competency. <laughs> 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 All right, yeah, uh, I did that with tips. my son. I did that with my son. Like, oh, you're good. Okay, cool. I tied his feet. Tied his feet together, tied his hands behind his back, <laughs> and I had him do, uh, we call it drown proofing. Uh-huh. And the first time he did it, he did not pass. What age is this one? I don't know, he's probably like seven. Oh, damn. Yeah. All right. that's, that, that's advanced for seven. He's but, good yeah, now, yeah. but you know, the first time I had to I had to go for the, right. for the little rescue. Right, story. and that's that thing that you say too, right? Where you're like, hey, put them in, if they're like in a leadership situation at work or whatever, yeah. right? Like you're like, hey, if they're overconfident, give them something just beyond their level. Yep. And yep. if they're underconfident, not gonna be, you give them something that and they guess can sort what? of do. This is when my son was like starting to get into big waves. And you know, you start if you start getting overconfident with the ocean, the, over, the ocean's gonna put mm-hmm. you in check. Mm-hmm. Big time. So you don't want to let that happen. Yeah. All right, back to what we're doing here. Discipline equals freedom field manual. That's available as well. It's how you stay on the path as an adult or as a kid. Lots of kids are reading that book as well. The audio version is on iTunes, Amazon Music, and Google Play as an MP3 album with tracks. Yes, sir. And then finally, we've got Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership. Books about leadership that we experienced in combat that Rob Jones is going to bring those principles to the government. With your help. Which is outstanding. Yes, sir. How many tweets do I get in a day that says about whatever politician on either side that says this guy could use your book, these people could use your book? Mm -hmm. They say it all the time. Send them to Congress, they say. I always say, well, send them. Give me an address. Echelon Front, that's our leadership consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com for details. We got EF Online, which is leadership training that you can do virtually. It's interactive. There's choose your own adventures, decision making drills in there for leaders. Go to efonline.com to check that out. We got the muster. The next one is in Sydney, Sydney, December 4th and 5th. We will be there. Who knows when we'll be back in Australia. In America, the 2020 dates will be out soon. So go to extremeownership.com to pay attention to that. And don't forget that all musters have sold out. And all musters will sell out. So we actually rearranged the room in Denver because it sold out so fast. We like needed, we, we bought more space and made got more seats. But we can't do that every time we maxed it out. So if you want to come, go to ExtremeOwnership.com. And then EF Overwatch, where we are taking proven leaders. I've got some really good, talking to Mike Sorelli, we got some candidates now that were not candidates, but we got some people that were hired. And 
that are just ge- giving the best experience, the, but we're getting the best um, referrals and feedback on the folks that we're placing. These are special operations and combat aviation leaders that are coming off the battlefield and going into civilian companies and helping them with their leadership and helping them win. Um, communication, it's important. We talked about that a decent amount today. If you want to communicate with us, then you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, Instagram, and on Die Wilfrusen Book. Echo is at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. Rob Jones. Okay, so robjonesforcongress.com. Yep. Facebook is at Rob Jones for Congress. Twitter is at Rob Jones VA. Right. As in Virginia. Right? Correct. There was OPVA in Ramadi, and it was OPVA. It was it was Virginia. Okay, but you could have thought it was the VA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to make it Rob Jones for Congress, but they don't allow it to be that long for Twitter, so we had to shorten oh, yeah. it. Got it. Instagram Rob Jones for Congress. YouTube Rob Jones for Congress. Echo. Anything else? Thank you, Rob Jones, for coming again. Rob, any final thoughts? Yeah, you know, I've I've been lucky enough. There have been kind of three main. Uh, influences in my life, external influences, Marine Corps, uh, Jim Jones, uh, which maybe we can talk about someday as well, uh, had a big impact on me at the right time. Finally, you know, extreme ownership, Jocko, Echo, you know, the, the podcast and everything. And I've been lucky enough to not only interact with all three of those, become a part of all three of those, befriend, you know, all three of those. Uh, you know, I'm just, and I'm, I just remain incredibly grateful uh, that I've had these opportunities. So thanks for having me on again. I'm looking forward to the next time already. Well, as you can imagine, the door's always open anytime you want to come on, you know, just knowing you, hearing your story, getting to see the way that you're operating out in the world. I, I throw that out there. Oh, he's an inspiration. You're an inspiration, bro. I mean, the fact of what you've done, what you continue to do. It's awesome, and it's it's. You might think it's cool to be here. It's even cooler for us, for me, to have you here and and hang out and get to get to talk to you and hang out with you. So, thank you for coming back. More important, thanks for the service and sacrifice that you've made for our country and that you continue to make, and what you're going to make in the future. You are a leader. You are a warrior, and thank you and to the rest of our warriors out there that are face to face with the forces of darkness in the world. Thanks to you all and to your families for your service and your sacrifice. And here at home, thanks to our police and our law enforcement and our firefighters and our paramedics and our EMTs and our dispatchers and our correctional officers and our border patrol and our ICE agents and our secret service and all the first responders out there, thank you for protecting us here at home. And everyone else that's out there, if you think you've kinda, if you think you've kinda maxed out on what you can do, if you think maybe it's time to back off the gas pedal a little bit and relax, if you think you've given everything, thing that you can give right now. Well, while you're thinking that, why don't you just take a moment and think about Rob Jones. Think about Rob Jones, who's still going, who's still going strong despite everything that life has thrown his way, he's still going. No matter what, he gets up and he gets after it. And I recommend that you all do the same. And until next time, This is Rob Jones and Echo and Jocko out.